Yes, we can hear you, Landon, and we can All see right. anybody in the live chat that is so ready for a hangout on pressurized water reactors. Yay! Yay. Um, why are we doing this? Because we can. Um, we've been trying to get something like this for a while. I know Landon has a, an interest in this particular topic. What, what topic doesn't he have an interest in? I got Average Joe in here, who is a fellow nuke from the Navy, like I was. He had a pretty in-depth uh, background of pressurized water reactors, and then he got his degree in nuclear engineering and is now working with boiler water reactors. But still, some of the principles are the same, I assume. But what we're going to do is we're going to have a little PowerPoint presentation, very basic overview, but... Pun intended. Go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and as we go through it, we'll kind of talk about each slide. And then if you got questions and Landon's got questions or act like the... The average Joe Schmuckatelli to ask questions, um, we'll try to answer them for you. And I think by the end of this, you might have a kind of a basic rudimentary understanding of what a pressurized water reactor is, how it works, and why it works the way it does. So, so first question, here? however, is is who uses pressurized water reactors? Uh, the military. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so the United States Navy uses pressurized water reactors uh, in all of its. Uh, submarine and carrier reactors and pressurized water reactors tend to be the most popular in the civilian world in terms of creating power uh, only because of reactor dynamics. Um, there's pros and cons we can get into, um, but lots of countries all over the world, China, India, Russia, lots of people like pressurized water reactors. So yeah, that's really the nutshell though. They're, they're cheap. They're that we understand pressurized water reactors very well and they're not the most efficient i think they have about a 20 percent efficiency like that 30 32 is it that high because it, i don't yeah. you know 20 something but it's still that's still pretty low but the first re first reactors were not pressurized water reactors when did pressurized water reactors come come around well one of the the, the first reactor was a graphite pile basically that had an open pool if i remember correctly and then when they started to try to work to actually make a functional reactor that could be used for power was a reactor called SL1 that the Army had, and it had three control rods. Unfortunately, it uh, wasn't very well uh, designed because the, one of the control rods you actually had to pull out manually, and as one person tried to do that, instead of pulling it out a nominal amount to add reactivity to the core, he pulled it out like several inches from what I understand, added enough reactivity to the core, which we'll explain to you in, in the presentation here, to cause a flash of the water to steam, ejecting the the rod and pinning him to the ceiling of the reactor, killing him instantly. And and the other two people died from radiation within like no time because there was a couple thousand rat, rat on contact. Do you do you remember that, Evan Joe? Do you remember that uh, yes. SO one? Yes, uh, they told us all about SO one. But uh, I would actually say that um, we started using pressurized water reactors in the mid to late fifties. With was which was both a push from Rickover or Admiral Rickover is the father of the nuclear navy, but he also was the head of the uh, the United States civilian power industry at the time, the nuclear power industry. So so at the same time as he was pushing uh, military reactors, he was pushing civilian reactors, um, and this kind of goes together with the Atoms for Peace program by uh, President Eisenhower. The yeah. idea. We could take uh, the power of the atom that we unfortunately used in war, and actually make clean power from it. And do you think uh, project, there's project plowshare? Do you think there's some politics involved in that? Before we get into the presentation, do you think there's some politics there? To because we were just given obviously the World War II and the atomic bombs were kind of fresh in people's minds, and they wanted to show that nuclear power could be used for other purposes other than destruction. I think there's a, a wide variety of different reasons, but definitely uh, politics being one. I mean, uh, on, on the flip side, a lot of the civilian industries, right, if you build them up, they make mining and refining uranium cheaper for the military who in the end want bombs, right? So when we talk uh, depleted uranium, which is uranium-238, a lot of that, a lot of that is uh, waste byproducts from... Yeah. the refinement of weapons grade uranium used and, for reactors and people don't uh, understand that uranium is actually a fairly common element on um, yeah, on earth right it's not like you know some rare rare thing there's actually a lot of uranium on earth yeah and where did it all come from 
Well, it came from uh, if our Sorry. models of how the solar system formed are reasonably correct to supernovae about 4.8 billion years ago and 4.7 billion years ago. Oh, you know, stars that collapsed underwent a spectacular explosion and seeded the cloud which formed our, which our sun and solar system formed. Yeah, young Earth creationism debunked. <laughs> All right, so let's start this off here. So we got here. I've kind of looked over this a little bit, but uh, not much. Um, you want to take it, Ojo? You want me to? Yeah, sure. I'll go. I'll go with it. So, so the idea with any reactor is to take a process and get something else out of it. For a nuclear reactor, what we do is we take uh, the heat energy created by fission, and then through multiple steps, transfer it into a mechanical energy for a generator, which then can create electrical energy. So, um, that's. That's really the, the broad overview of how reactors work is we try to figure out how to get the heat energy from vision and then make electrical power to power homes or whatever, right? So, yeah, and I think that's probably a good, uh, you know, one misconception I think people have is they think that the, the, the heat, most of the heat is generated from the actual fission itself. That's a common misconception. The Most of the heat that's generated is due from the fission fragments that are produced. Yes. In, in yeah. addition to obviously the two or three neutrons that are produced that go on to do continue the criticality. So you have these highly energetic kinetic energy fission fragments that are vibrating very, very fast. And those you know, those will then uh, through inelastic collisions uh, transfer that to the moderator, which is in this case will be water. Yeah. And then the water heats up. That's that's I mean, how you extract the heat energy. Right. I mean, one of the things that is, is 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 that you know people wonder well, why are nuclear reactions so much more energetic than chemical reactions? And the answer is in an atom, most of the mass is concentrated in the center of the nucleus. Certain nuclei become very unstable and will split. And when you have two nuclei, you know, two nucleus is very close to each other, their their positive forces repel and they repel each other at at enormous speeds, and that those it, one of the primary uh, generators heat is essentially the the kick that those two fragments are given when they because you know you, you imagine two magnets they're really close to each other right the, the 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 repulsion is very very strong, and and so they fly apart at great speed. They also send out fragments, um, neutrons, and you can also get gammas and other sort of uh, cool stuff. But but the primary thing is is a is essentially a repulsion of the, of the two fragments, typically at a two to one ratio is typically when it when it splits. So reactors are about creating conditions where you get unstable nuclei. It splits the two nuclei fly Start apart and um, and send off um, bouncing and rouncing around imparting kinetic energy into their surroundings. The, the a chemical reaction is dealing with electrons that are outside on the, on the outer edge of, of the atom. They're relatively lightweight and they get dragged down by the nucleus. So chemical reactions um, suffer from the fact they've got this nucleus, which is essentially dead weight on a chemical um, scale. Whereas nuclear starts with two, and, and of course, most people don't realize that the atoms are particularly are, are very, very, very um, concentrated in the center. If you took the simplest, smallest atom like hydrogen, and you took, it, hydrogen is a proton in, in the nucleus, an electron going around. If you took that proton and scaled it up the size of the ping pong ball, the electron would be over about 1400 meters away, or well, you know, 2000 feet away. Most of the atom is, is empty space, and it's that concentrated nucleus that contains about 99.95 percent of the mass. So when you take something like uranium, you cause it to become unstable, and you get two fragments very close to each other. Their repulsive forces cause them to go, you know, fly away at, at, at enormous speeds, and that's where the heat comes from. And thank you for somebody pointed out, uh, Bo, uh, Bo um, how, how to get this full screen. I had no idea. So thank you for, for noticing my ineptness on that because I couldn't figure it out. And also to add what he's saying, a lot of people, you know, they, they do realize that positive charges repel each other. And they say, well, in the nucleus, you only have positive charges. Why don't they repel? Good question. Um, there's something called the strong nuclear force that holds um, the new, a neutron together and or a proton. And that's, there's a secondary effect of that strong nuclear force that carries beyond the boundaries of the nucleon. And what that does is it actually binds that nucleus together. And it's called a binding energy. And really what happens is you have a transfer of mass into energy because of the mass 
energy equivalency equals mc squared. And so believe it or not, if you actually took each individual particle in the nucleus and weighed them individually, they would actually weigh more than they would as, as, as combined in the nucleus. That difference is called a mass defect. Now, it's hard to conceptualize that because when you think of like basketballs or something, if I had 10 basketballs and I weigh each one individually, they're going to weigh 10 basketballs. And I weigh them put together, they're going to weigh 10 basketballs. The, the range of the strong nuclear force is very, very limited. That's why it's only a secondary uh, thing of the strong nuclear force that causes this. But when the, the, the atom is split and it breaks apart, that mass defect, that energy, is what's imparted to the to the... The fission fragments, that's what we're extracting. We want that mass defect. And that comes from literally E equals yes. square, which everybody's aware of. Now, now the unstable atoms that 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 will will undergo fission splitting are tend to be your massive atoms. Uh, so you, you can get fission at at, at specialized cases in, in, in the small stuff, but but the, the your general you know split an atom into two pieces comes from your heavier elements. Uh, and so yeah. That's that's why you know uranium, for example, is a fairly common uh, element, and it has a particular type that can become unstable under certain conditions. There's, there's what are those conditions? The, ever heard of the uh, field a uh, field yield curve, also known as the May West curve, is what they used to call it before it became politically yeah, correct to do it. Yeah, but yeah. they used to be called the May West curve, and what and what this curve was was basically it plotted your nucleons against. Um, how much energy you needed to put in to get fission out or to be fused together to get energy out. So that's why we can fuse lighter elements, get energy out, but we split heavier elements to get energy out. So, so certain things in the middle towards like iron, yeah, it, it doesn't much work because you need more energy in the system to get out. Um, somebody had asked, is the weak nuclear interact weak nuclear force that holds the atom together? No, the nu weak nuclear reactions, uh, so the new weak nuclear force is used mostly is for like decay modes. You'll yeah. have uh, beta decay uses weak nu nuclear mode. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm going way back. Well, I'm, I'm going off on limb here, Joe. So nuclear engineer me. Um, I know that something like a muon and a, um, I think it's a, a neutrino can combine, have a W minus intermediate vector boson to go to a electron and an anti neutrino or something like that. But I don't know if that's actually a weak nuclear force that causes that. But since it uses the W negative intermediate vector boson is that not a weak nuclear force <clears throat> yeah the weak interactions uh take place inside like neutrons or protons um for the the very much smaller scale subatomic particles as opposed to the uh uh protons neutrons or, or electrons because those are the force carriers yeah. right the, yeah. The, yeah. the intermediate vector bosons wz um, those are force carriers right yeah and so, so when an atom becomes unstable and begins to violently oscillate, when the two pieces get far enough that, that all of a sudden the strong nuclear force can't contain them, they separate. And now the, 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 the charges, the positive charges repel as well. And then those, those you know, continue to accelerate away. Very good. Joe, you got anything else to add on this? Uh, yeah, so so uh, one of the things, you know, why do we talk about nuclear energy as opposed to other forms of energy? Um, so if we were to burn coal, burning coal releases on the order of KeV or kilo electron volts mm -hmm. for a chemical reaction, right? So oxygen combines with the piece of the coal, makes carbon dioxide, probably carbon monoxide, and then releases heat energy in the range of I want to say it's 40 kilo electron volts per chemical inter interaction, right? That's all orbitals. That's all electrons. When we talk about fission, right? One fission releases 200 MeV, right? So we're talking at least a thousand times more energy per event. Yeah. And the vast majority of that we can reclaim. So we're talking 175 MeV from from an interaction we can re reclaim so we're, we're talking lots of energy compared to burning coal or natural gas which lots of energy with very little mass yeah, it's, called, it's called power density if i remember correctly. yep yes. energy density yeah was it energy density or power density is it energy density either way okay it's fine um and if i remember correctly and again i'm not looking any of this up right now i honestly not i'm just kicking it back um but if i remember correctly uh electron volt is the amount of energy required to put one electron through uh, 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 one, uh, it's one 
it's how, okay. It's one electron through an electromotive force of one volt to go. What what is the oh God? Give me give me the exact across point. across one volt, right? Okay, across across one ohm. Yeah, I think it's just one. It's a potential energy, so it's. A, but it's the it's the amount an, of it's energy, energy, yeah. energy which is the electromotive force to to cause an electron to accelerate across. I thought it was like an ohm or something. Uh, I don't think an ohm. I don't think there's a direct correlation. But anyway, let's go to the next. I I but I like that kind of stuff. I like it. I, I, it's been a while since I looked at that. Yeah. All right, next one. Now we get to the, the bare bones reactor. Yes. Okay. All right. So some of the characteristics of a pressurized water reactor, uh, as opposed to different types, is there is a separate loop in between where the reactor is it or re, the where the reactor is and where your turbine generator is. So it would be like uh, the oil system in your car is separate from the refrigeration system or your cooling system in your car. They don't mix. The plant I work at right now is a boiling water reactor and that's one system, which is very different. So when we talk about some of the things that make a pressurized water a water reactor, a pressurized water reactor, right? We're talking about a primary loop in which where the reactor goes. We exchange heat from the primary loop, which would be our reactor vessel. You have Steve showing it off. Um, we exchange heat to another loop, the secondary loop, through the steam generator. Now, the steam generator is at a lower pressure, which uh, that water uh, boils and turns into steam. And then we send that steam through a, a turbine, which is just a big fan in reverse. That big fan not in reverse. This is not... It's not definitely not. Synthase. Just let you guys know. Don't get but, them. But I thought I thought that's just way ATC AT. Yeah, <laughs> mayonnaise works. I can't it's even say mayonnaise. It's not <laughs> awesome, right? So so that's mechanically linked to a generator, right? And generators work by spinning them. We can talk about uh, uh, magnets and uh, all the generated electromotive force and stuff like that. Y you can. Go I tell you, we got some great so. questions already. Wow. I, mean, I mean, I was not expecting people to ask these types of questions, and I'm actually thrilled to death. Um, somebody had to actually answer or asked. I wasn't on a sub, but somebody actually asked about um, primary induction cooling. And, and, and I do remember this, though. Um, there are three types of induction that I remember. There's a high-pressure loop induction that would go directly into, like, the, this, the main coolant. And then there was, like, an intermediate induction, and then there was, like, a, a low-pressure induction. And that's how you would actually try to get – water into the, these coolant loops if that's what you're referring to but i wasn't on a sub plant um the way it worked on my plant was a little bit different we had four valves there were suck fuck fill and spill yep okay, okay. and basically uh fill was to, to, to fill something up oh wait was that the second was that the condenser was it yeah no it was so it was it was it was it was, it was spill was to, if we had too much water on the secondary side fill was to get the second side um suck i don't remember oh for the i think it was from the bilge water but fuck was the worst because fuck was to the, the main primary coolant loop and what that did was it opened a direct path through seawater to get water to cool the reactor so if you mm. had to use that valve which was chained um bad bad news because you, 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 you didn't have an, emer uh, an emergency heat exchanger for that purpose because no. okay had, the way the d the d2g that we had was three loop um it basically um, what you guys see here, the system here, there's actually more than one steam generator in a D, uh, uh, D2G reactor plant. So you would have uh, three individual steam generators in each three cooling loops, and then you'd have three pumps on each steam generator, and that would go to a single header to the turbine. And then in the turbine, you would have a high-pressure side and a low-pressure side as well to extract steam over stages because you, what you want to do is you want to get the maximum amount of efficiency and extraction of the energy of the steam to the generator and and you don't want water forming in the process because if you have a turbine going at several thousand rpm i think they were like 20 some odd thousand rpm or something like that remember um what happens do you think guys when you have water hitting those those rotors at that amount of speed it causes damage. catastrophic damage. uh failure yeah. of it, can be, it can it can literally cause one of the blades to fly through the freaking uh the, the deck so you gotta want to you kind of want to do it in i mean you you mean you've you've seen what happens to a an airliner when when its turbine goes and flies apart and 
it's a fuselage. You know, this is a similar type of catastrophic failure. Yeah, when they mean catastrophic, it means you're dead. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so some of some of the more characteristics of uh, pressurized water reactors is uh, the water in the primary loop stays water. So we're talking very high pressures, very high temperatures, like which pounds per square yeah, inch. Of yeah, which we we talk about later. And then your secondary loop is typically half the pressure and roughly the same temperature. So that's why it turns to steam. Um, and then in our condenser is actually uh, vacuum. So, so that's a vacuum pressure. Yep. So See, someone asked yeah. about cavitation. Okay, one sec. Um, just to, to, so that what he's talking about, we want this water in here always to maintain water. The reasons for that are one, water is a much better moderator and it's also a better transmitter of heat. When you have steam in here, it will cause, it will be a very, very poor uh, conductor of heat. You can have thermal damage to the control rods and to other things in the reactor. So we want this to be under pressure all the time. All the time. And I think you have an upcoming slide that explains how that's done with the pressurizer, right? But you can get, you know, steam can generate lots of physical damage of, yes. of, the, of the containment system. So you want to avoid essentially steam, i.e. boiling. The, the cavitation, what they're talking about, is what happens in a pump. Um, yep. If you have, there's something called net positive suction head, which is the amount of pressure at the impeller to prevent cavitation. And if you do not meet that, you'll have little air bubbles or whatever, you know, coming out of solution uh, from the water that will start going around the impeller. Well, what keeps this impeller cooled is the water. So if you have cavitation, you have an overheating condition. And this actually happened to me with a fire pump one time. And it had a little uh, plug on the very top, a little um, cock valve. And uh, well, whatever the hell plug was. But I, being the dumbass I was, try know that it was heated up. I don't know if the outlet was closed. I don't remember what caused the cavitation. But I tried to release the pressure doing that way. What do you think happened to that little plug? Uh, melted. It blew out of my hand. Yeah. And it hurt. Uh, my <laughs> really burned my hand. Um, I had to sleep in water like for like two days. Um, it was that bad. Um, so yeah, not a good idea. The cavitation is a very bad thing. And also cavitation for a sub, uh, it can actually give away your position. And from what I understand, and this may be secret, I don't know, talk to a submariner, but I've heard that they can actually identify the type of vessel by the type of cavitation uh, audibly. Is that true? Uh, we can definitely tell... Uh, different classes of ship by blade rate, by how their propeller moves, by how many propellers they have. So uh, that's all I'll say about that. Yeah, one of the most, uh, I, and I will say this, one of the most closely guarded secrets is the design of the screw. And that means basically the, the, the tilt of the blades, how many there are, comp component of it, the leading edge, you know, how the slope of that. There's a lot of factors that go into to reduce cavitation so it doesn't give a position away because one of the greatest things for a submarine is to not, you know, <laughs> where you're at. Not, not, not be detected. So the one of the uh, ways to maintain your secrecy of your propeller screws is to not let Toshiba anywhere near your secrets. Yeah, don't no Toshiba. No Toshiba. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, all right, so, so you want the next one, or you want to like explain this anymore or anything like the secondary side? Or, and basically, uh, the secondary side look at it. This is just a, a basically water down here, heats up, turns to steam, steam turns to turbine, and then cools off because this is usually goes to seawater or lake. And believe it or not, this actually over here is one of your biggest types of pollution. This is called thermal pollution because this is what raises the temperature of the lake that the nuclear reactor is on, and that could cause environmental problems. So when they talk yeah, about I, mean, I mean, for example, you know, fish that are comfortable at certain temperatures yeah. and you raise the temperature and you can get, you know, algae production and lowering of oxygen levels and so forth. And you can, you know, make exactly. life very unhappy to the point of killing it, boiling it away. Um, it, yeah, let's go to the next, the next right. slide. I think it explains some of the, the, the pieces in more detail. And by the way, my reactor is 150 megawatts. Of what was asking. Okay, so go ahead. Yeah. All right. So uh, just so we're all on the same page, we're going to cover some some of the terms so people know what we're talking about, right? And the primary loop is going to be the loop with the reactor in it that has the uh, the reactor, um, the pressurizer, and the pumps, right? So inside the reactor, you're going to have fuel assemblies and control rods. Fuel assemblies hold your fuel, which we'll talk about a little bit more. And control rods are used to slow down or control the reaction rates for fission. 
Um, your pressurizer is a steam void where, you know, we just, we just got to uh, talking about how the primary loop stays water. Well, not in the pressurizer. In the pressurizer, we have banks of very, very powerful electric heaters that create a steam bubble. The steam bubble manages to keep pressure, like an accumulator, if you guys are, are used to uh, air systems or oil systems, accumulators minimize transients in pressure and force the entire system to be at roughly the same pressure. So that's how we make sure that the water in the, the rest of the, the primary loop stays water and not steam, because when you have steam inside your core, you melt down. So is that basically a pressure buffer? Yeah, what, it's, yeah. it's funny because uh, Fred has said, fuck, that would take some delicate balance. Yeah, actually it does. And the way that works is actually kind of interesting. Um, there's usually a nozzle up here, and the nozzle will spray or atomize uh, water that will come in here. And that will cause the steam blanket to change size, okay? And as it does that, it exerts a pressure here. And there's something called Pascal's pressure law. Joe, I have it memorized verbatim for all this time. Can you <laughs> tell me Pascal's pressure law? Because we had to memorize it in nuke school, so do you remember it? Uh, not right off the top of my head. I keep thinking I, I, I had this for some reason. reason. <laughs> I'll die knowing this. Okay, the pressure exerted on the closed fluid at rest will be transmitted equally and undiminished throughout the fluid into the walls of its container. What that means yeah. is if you press down here, that pressure will be felt equally and undiminished throughout this entire system, keeping the whole system under pressure. Okay. Um, there's also some relief valves up here that are not shown. There's usually two water relief valves and one steam, but it depends on your yeah. tank. And when the relief valves go out, I think it's the other round. I think it's two steam and one water. Yeah. But let's say you have one steam and one water. So, Which one do you think would be better to go off first? And, and by the way, I, I learned it as a change in pressure at any point uh, of a, of a an enclosed fluid, that's important, yeah, enclosed. is transmitted undiminished to all the points of the fluid. Equally, that's, a, that's a great fluid and the is yep. Just two different ways of stating the same thing. Let's ask, let's ask the live ch the chat. If you have two relief valves here that if you get an overpressure condition, and you have one for steam, and you have one for water, which one do you think rationally should um, be released first? If you answered steam, you're right. Okay. The reason being steam has less volumetric, uh, less volume, right? It takes less steam to have a uh, change in pressure. When you have to actually have water being released from the main coolant loop, you're in a shit condition. So, but I don't know, throw that out there. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to... I'm gonna keep going if, if you guys don't mind. Sure, yeah, yeah, cool. that's all right. All right, so we have a steam generator, which, uh, as you can see, most steam generators have a bunch of tubes, and what happens is the primary loop is on the inside of the tubes, and your secondary water goes on the outside of the tubes. Oops. As the uh, the secondary water heats up, it turns into steam. Uh, we have steam dryers. And by the way, people are asking if if it's pure water or there's substances no, in the water. The it is water cause too much. Um, uh, reactor grade water is very pure, but we still put stuff in it to minimize corrosion. Yeah, because you would have a lot of corrosion. I mean, so when you say pure water, is it like pure water? Uh, there's we add chemicals to it um, to vent corrosion. What's called car? Uh, um, was it carbon steel piping impingement? Uh, we typically don't use carbon steel for yeah, the primary I'm, loop. I'm trying to think. I remember carbon. It wasn't pitting. It was um. Yeah. Was a galvanic reaction. Another uh, another one asks is where where does the where does it vent on the sub? Does it go out to the, the, the primary loop is not going to vent in a submarine. Well, so, it, well, in an emergency, you'd vent to sea, would you not? Because we did. But normal yeah. operations. Yeah. Normal. In in normal operations, we don't we'd have to vent anywhere. Um, which, which we will explain a little bit later, but, uh, there's no, and, and one of the reasons why nuclear, uh, nuclear reactors were so ideal for submarines is, is air independent, uh, right? Submarines don't have a lot of air. We typically need it for the people. Um, so we like, uh, things that generate power that don't require air or discharging things outside the submarine. And, uh, Oh, he's talking about an emergency. In, a, in an emergency, uh, we can discharge to sea, and, which is actually uh, a event. They have to be. Yeah, yeah, I was I was in charge of the discharge log, which is how many and and what the activity is of all the discharges we uh, send overboard, 
and that goes to Congress for review. It's kind of so. reactor incident, yeah. You know what we did one time? <laughs> I'm out, so they can't do shit to me. Um, <laughs> we actually we actually left the reactor compartment door open once at criticality. <laughs> I it wasn't very much. It wasn't like full open. What? Left open. Um, I can tell you right now, heads rolled for that one. Um, I can imagine. Not, me, not my plan. It was it was M two. I was M one. Um, wow. Yeah, did they bad. leave it ajar? It was locked they ajar. Did. I assume. Well, there's multiple people that have to check. There's a there's a door, right? There's a reactor compartment door, and, and it is multiply checked by multiple people because it has to be shut at criticality. It's, it's, so the door is, and, the, and this diagram would be where. Oh, well, uh, who knows? It, it, nope. The door would be uh, in the reinforced concrete containment somebody, field. Yeah, this is the concrete. Yeah. Okay. It's somewhere in here, right? Um, but obviously, two people fucked up because it's two people. Two people have to sign it. for it. Yeah, they have to sign for it. Um, so heads did roll for that because they uh, they probably rate what we call radar, where you just go, oh, it's okay. You just sign for it. Bad things happen when you do that. Anyways, go on. All right, so, uh, and then we talk about the secondary loop. And your secondary loop is going to be the water on the other side of the steam generator um, that goes off as steam to our turbine, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. Your turbine is mechanically uh, connected to your generator, which creates electrical power. Um, and then the, the steam, after it goes through the turbine, uh, condenses in the condenser, which is at a vacuum, and then turns back into water, and then we send it back into the steam generator in a closed loop, right? So our primary loop is a closed loop, and our secondary loop is a closed loop. So yeah, and I don't a know question that. about about the the fluids here. Um, talk about in terms of where you'd find radiation and fluids. Uh, all th this all this water is radioactive, and you have what's called crud traps that occasionally will get uh, cobalt sixty stuck in them. So where is that? Where is what the is the source of that? Really, really find in areas like uh, bends, um, pump, those kind of places have crud traps. And when you do, when the, when you go first go into a reactor, it's called an initial reactor compartment entry, and you set up a, a a control point area here, and you have a person who's in charge of that, and that person is God. If they tell you can't go in, you can't go in. Doesn't matter if the fucking president of the United States, you are God. Um, seriously, I mean, you, you really can tell an admiral, go fuck yourself. You're not going in, if, even if they insist. That is your control point. That's how it was on my ship. Is that how it was on your thing? Uh, when you, I mean, you, you, might, you had a uh, qualified reactor department control watch, or at least um, react, uh, what's me, um, ah, what do they call it? Control. Now, I, re uh, I, re control watch. I remember it was yeah. explained that, that uh, the guy who was in charge of that, um, God asked permission for him to go into the reactor oh, yeah. vessel. Yeah, when God <laughs> says, okay. But, but you, you basically, you, you have I to lock it. everything that goes into this the reactor. Any piece of equipment that goes in is considered to be potentially radioactive. You have to treat it radioactive. You have to mark it with tape. You have to do an initial uh, Geiger test of it. Um, then when it leaves, and you have to, you have what's called a SRPD, self-reading pocket dosimeter, which is a little pen-like looking thing that you look through. And uh, we've, we've gone way beyond that. I am old. <laughs> okay, back back in my day, before people like average Joe got like the good yep. shit, we had yeah, these yeah. little fucking things you looked through, and they had so, a cat whisker, and had a scale on it. And so when the the the, the charged particles would go through this thing, it would be ionizing radiation, scale. right? Yeah, yeah ionizing radiation. Right. So it would cause the cat whisker to move across the scale. And that's how you would, you would get an idea, at least, of how much radiation you were exposed to. So. Yep. But but so 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 the, the primary state now what about what would be the cause of radiation being detected in the secondary loop? Um that would be from a leak in yeah. your YouTubes yeah. between yeah. the primary and secondary side. It does happen. It does happen. Now now the other way you could possibly get it not necessarily in the secondary loop, but um in commercial reactors, there there's a little bit of leakage in the primary loop. Right, and that goes to to bilges or tanks, and then we pump outside of the containment shield to go to our liquid rad waste processing facility, which is not pictured here. This is only a very basic overview. Yeah, and so, somebody asked what the PSI was. If I told you that, I'd have to kill you. I can just tell you there's a couple thousand PSI. Uh, we we I talk about it in cool. one of the next slides. All right. Yeah. Well, ours that's, was that's not secret. Two thousand. Ours was two thousand. Set points were about two ten. The T hot loop, which this this loop right here, this is called the T hot. This is called the T cold. 
the average is the average between T hot and TT divided by two. Um, this was a, about 460. This was about 440, average 450, if I remember correctly, somewhere in that ballpark. Okay, so next next thing, or do you want to talk about? Do you have something on the control rod? Do you want to? Yeah, yeah so tell me, tell me to ask about the control rod well, in terms of this, what. But is that this pre, uh, PowerPoint or the, or the next? Uh, it's in this. I think the next one is fuel, but we can talk about control rods with fuel. Okay. So, 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 one ask in terms of what what is effect do the control rods have on the uh, hot and cold return? This is what we can spend five hours talking about. To be honest. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's go over uh, all the pieces. So this way, the everyone in the chat kind of knows what we're talking about before we go way off into reactivity land. I love that shit. Poisons and burn and gad rods and all the good stuff. So let's let's talk about the basic first. So if you can go to the next slide. Oh, ah, we're going to talk about energy transfer first, right? So this is this is uh, what we were talking about in the beginning, right? Reactors, we want to do something and then create power. So here, um, we create heat through fission. Uh, those fission fragments, which are actually charged uh, large atom, uh, large atoms, um, transfer their heat to the uh, fuel rod and the fuel assembly, which then gives its thermal energy to the coolant system through uh, radiative heat and uh, forced convection. And then that water transfers its uh, heat energy to the secondary loop and steam. And then steam, high pressure steam has the ability to move things and we make it move a very large turbine or several turbines. Um, and then that rotational energy, uh, you can read about how generators work. We don't need to get into that, but we make ge generators make electrical power. And these and these uh, fission fragments can vary. They can usually they're things like xenon, promethium, samarium, technetium. Um, what are the most common ones? Um, strontium. Um, yeah, Toronto is, is one of the comments, and it's yeah. and and there are also rare, uh, you know, fragment modes as well. But yeah. usually, it's it's pieces. two pieces, uh, about a two to one mass ratio. Mm -hmm. And the average amount of neutrons released is two point four for uranium two thirty five. So that means that no matter what you you don't take single reactions, you take what's called a macroscopic level, right? So you yeah. basically saying okay, overall across the core. For the average amount of fissions, what is the average amount of neutrons I'm going to get per fission? It's going to be about 2.4. That's how you have a self-sustaining critical reaction. Yep. All right. So hopefully the next one we talk about fuel. Yes. Bam. Fuel. All right. So this is what fuel actually looks like. Um, and it's a little bit different between the different types. But generally, they look like this. Um, so uranium uh, is lightly enriched. So it has a little bit more uranium-235 than occurs naturally. And then we turn it into uranium ceramic pellets, which are really small. And, and for some reason, I didn't include a, an, a real size. So, so there know, are, I, there, actually there, had, I actually had a, a simulated one when I was a kid, believe it or not. Because we so, yeah, there, free, And I actually had a little black pellet. And as a kid, I was like six or something, whatever the hell I was. I always thought that if I dropped it, it would explode. Yeah. Well, you know, so so uranium comes in in, in, in max, most elements come in, in in different forms. You know, the number of protons, ninety-two in the case of uranium, um, is is paired when you have a neutral atom with the number of electrons in the case of uranium ninety-two. And so the chemical uh you know characteristics of uranium comes from that ninety-two charges. But there are also a bunch of neutrons. You can have very you can have the same number of protons but different number of neutrons. So when you talk about U-235 or U-238, they're both uranium. It's just one has three extra neutrons. And those neutrons change the characteristics of the atom and change how it will react. So in the case of a reactor, typically U-235, when it absorbs something called a neutron, will become unstable and, and fission or split apart. Whereas U-238, on the other hand, the typical type of neutrons you find in reactors don't do that. Um, so when you talk about your enriching, normally your U-235 is a fairly rare percentage. The, the percentage is what? The natural uranium is what? Uh, I want to oh, say 0.2% or something like that. Very something low. very small. 
Yeah, it's very small compared to the how much. Uh, and made. then for civilian reactors, we like to enrich it up to six percent. So ninety four percent is going to be uranium two thirty eight. Six percent is going to be uranium two thirty five. And and that's nowhere near weapons grade enrichment, by the way. No. Yes. Um, so what, so typically on the case of of you know the 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 kind of 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 enrichment. I mean, you know, that the, they talk about reactor grade being somewhere between, depending on the type of reactor, between, let's say, 2 and 5%. Although typically what you were using stuff at around 3, probably what? 3%? Civilian reactors use 3 to 6%. Yeah. Now, um, the, the, the technical term for weapons grade is at 90%. However, um, it is quite possible to get uncontrolled nuke reactions, things that go boom, much lower than 90%. It takes more and it's harder. But for example, ironically, the very first nuclear weapon was not weapons grade in that sense. Um, so, so the, the, but typically, you know, in, in fuel, in, in fuel enrichment is a process by which you're, you're increasing the concentration of U-235, the useful reactor uranium, and decreasing uh, U-238. Right. And w what is interesting, too, is over the, because uh, in, a, in a civilian nuclear power plant, we can expect these fuel assemblies to be in a core for six years. So every two years, we'll refuel. We only take out one third of the most used fuel assemblies. We put in one third new fuel assemblies, and then we swap yeah. them all around to get an even burn. Yeah, and we'll, on, by the way, we will get and stuff like that. Um, but the, we said we're talking about like the stuff we haven't got to yet. We will talk about a little about sodium graphite reactors like Chernobyl, and we will talk about cost yeah. and power. I think so. Just hang tight. So, so actually, towards the end of those six years, these fuel assemblies with uranium two thirty eight, they end up absorbing neutrons and turning into plutonium two forty one, um, which then contribute to reactor power later at the towards the end of their the the useful life of the fuel assembly so yeah we yeah we can actually we can actually make more fuel in reactors we're just yes. not allowed to yeah, yeah. so I, I i i will at this point confess that um you know um as people know i was i was involved um in the um monitoring and 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 analysis of the um Mount St. Helens uh, eruption. I was actually there present when the thing blew off. And um, we were there to go and grab the first samples and fly them down to the Reed reactor, where we put them inside the reactor to radiate them in order to get new, what's called neutron activation analysis, to understand the elements that were coming out of the volcano. And so we had a lot of samples going into the Reed reactor. They weren't very, very, very careful. And I contrived to stick in a nice sample of U-238 in the middle of it and managed to cook myself up some neptonium, plutonium, a little bit of americium, um, which is still in the reed reactor uh, pool. Um, nice. I'm dumb enough not to, to, but you know, I actually used the gamma ray spectrometer and said, yeah, I created yeah, neptonium, and plutonium, and americium. So nice. Isn't that like americium so rare that it's worth a lot of freaking money? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so you yeah. cook it. You cook it enough. But anyway, it was not. It was. It was not uh, supposed to be done, and so it actually never did it. And so. And, um, and a couple of things we can point out here. One, um, uranium thirty five is pretty easy to get, so that's one of the reasons they do use uranium thirty five. And also, uranium thirty five has a has a property different than two thirty eight. It it actually likes slow neutrons. They're called thermalized neutrons. And and water has this really awesome ability to, to slow down. Fast neutrons and just slow neutron. Yeah, uh, and we'll we'll talk. Those about neutrons the bounce around, but but that's a, yeah. that's a critical thing about the speed of neutrons. So right. we'll, we'll get right. we'll get into that, I guess more. So, anyways, on the fuel assembly here, uh, so you can see, and, yep. So uh, the fuel pellets go into the fuel rod, and the fuel rod is just metal. That's all it is. It's it's a fancy metal we call zirc alloy, either zirc two or zirc four. Um, and then we put a we put all of them together in twelve by twelve or fourteen by fourteen a matrix, and then uh, put them together with the spacer grids, and then they sit vertically in our core. And that's so why zirconium? 
Uh, we use zirconium because it has good heat transfer properties, but also it is most, uh, so neutrons like to just go through the metal without uh, doing embrittlement or excessive embrittlement to the metal, um, which we can talk about. And I wrote, uh, this is an important thing because you've got the, all these nuclear also, particles flying around. Right. Um, it's, it's, it's not nice for structural you know, integrity of, of most things. See, see, so you need little, something that can, can, can withstand the radiation. See, this particular, this particular reactor uses fuel raw, uh, excuse me, uh, you know, in the fuel assembly, you actually have these tubes. Ours use fuel plates. Oh yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to talk about that. So <laughs> <laughs> it's still classified. Yeah. So, uh, but, uh, but the principles are sa similar, but, uh, they, they have like what's called clading. The clading um, is a zerk oxide of some type, and, and that present, prevents buckling. So it also has that property as well. But as he said, there's some thermal effects, and you don't want to have brittle fracture inside a, a fuel assembly because that would be really, really bad. Um, all right. So what do you want more talk about here? Uh, I think that's about it. They're about what's a typical long. lifetime of one of these fuel rods? Um, you can go back usable, six usable years. one. Six years. Yeah. And so then they just pull them out, and I th I thought yep. I, I thought they um don't they kind of like use uh oh God I thought they use them for um I think they they thought they extracted something out of it to try to use for like space program stuff, but no, they don't let us reprocess fuel anymore. Okay, but they, they, they used to be. I mean, the, the the stuff for like plutonium two thirty nine comes from a very different process. Uh, I mean, we do create. Plutonium-239 yep. and 241 inside the fuel towards the end of life based on how much uranium-238 there is. And it, it does noticeably contribute to overall core power. So, okay. Reprocessing is where we rip apart old fuel assemblies and then take out the stuff we could use again in a reactor. I'm just looking at a bunch of the questions. All right. And see, I told you I only had nine slides, and here we are. We're almost at an hour. Yeah. Oh. And I will point out that that, that plutonium two thirty eight is a common thing used in um, deep space probes. And yeah, and for, plutonium two thirty eight is, is is also generated in a very very different process, and it's also um, not usable for things going boom. Yeah, those are the radiolytic heat generators. Yes. Yeah, but that's but yeah. those aren't reactors though. Yes. Not typically, no. Yeah. Uh, no, all they do is they generate heat, and then they can either pump the heat around or uh, technically thermocouples generate power. Yeah, so something like, for example, the probe that went past Pluto has a plutonium-238. Yeah. Perhaps there are plans yeah, designed yeah. specifically for using spent rods. I thought so. Um, I thought there was some kind of nuclear power plants that were that uh, – The, the that GE – Like 30 years ago. Yeah, GE has a power plant – out called the prism reactor. It's a liquid sodium pool type reactor. So it's actually a low pressure uh, reactor that sits in a big pool. Um, and that one can use spent fuel. So uh, unfortunately we can't build, a, you know, we- And yes, Voting Voyager one is an example of, of, a, of, a, of essentially a radioisotope generator. And that's and not so, a reactor, yeah. that's just essentially Using radioactive decay of 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 U two thirty eight, which is about eighty seven years, as I recall. Pep Pepo asked how much waste there be. In my, I can only speak for the plant that I was in. Most of the waste was actually low grade things that were used inside the reactor compartment for whatever reasons. Uh, you know, like uh, towels. Uh, things were used for like spills. Things that use any kind of tools that were needed to be. You know, uh, yeah, that, the vast that's majority. Those, those, but those are a lot of waste that build up after time. Yeah, the vast majority of the waste is like towels. We we call them uh, anti seize or or uh, anti contamination clothing. So like the the orange rubber gloves that you see or the big yellow suits that Karen you see. Suits. Yeah, we don't wash those. We we take them oh and get God. them. You know, they, they get <laughs> processed. So um, and they're not fun. No, I'm no, they're not. they're not very fun to wear. All right. So to get back on topic. So you can see on the left, when we're talking about U-tubes, that is what a steam generator looks like. And that's what primary water flows on the inside of. And on the outside would be your water that you turn into steam. 
on a, on the right side, we have a, a cutaway of what what that would look like, right? So we inject water into the feed water inlet. Uh, I'm sorry, secondary water through the, in the feed ring up. Well, yeah, the pri the, the primary. The, this is going to yeah, primary. Down. Yeah, primary comes in and goes on the inside of the tubes, and then comes back down, and then goes out. And then our feed water comes in, goes down, and then you can kind of see a little bit of a sheath. And then inside that sheath, it turns into steam and then goes to your steam dryers and stuff like that. and comes out as pure steam. So. And, um, and it, it's, we had talked about the um, radiation on the secondary side. If you're going to get any, it's usually going to be because these, you, these, these tubes, YouTube, thing, they will eventually start leaking. Yeah, pinhole leaks. Pinhole. They're usually easy to, easy to get. All right, let, I think I think the next few goes into the real meat. So what, uh, what what's go. the cause of those those leaks? How did how do those leaks form? Corrosion, corrosion and vibration. Yeah, mechanical agitation. I mean, yeah. So yeah, so they, they, they have, there's a something called primary water chemist that will actually try to to maintain specific pH of the water and whatever else they will add to it to try to minimize these types of corrosions. But like anything else. Metal will eventually corrode of some kind. So, okay. So I, didn't, I qualified secondary chemist. I didn't qualify primary chemist. That was for the. <laughs> yeah, year. I got that. Um, you were an ELT, were you not? Yes. Okay, so you you've got to do the whole shebang. Mm hmm. It was good times. Yeah, like, um, I, had to, I had to. I had to learn it. Never had to do it. Not fun. Not going to do it. Yeah, those primary check chems when you got the. Uh, and are auditing you good times yeah i wouldn't want to go through that i, I didn't even like to take samples of anything such a such a rigmarole I'll just take samples of anything all right moving on to the, the meat and potatoes let's get to the fun stuff reactivity so reactivity is a term we use to describe how neutron populations change uh inside the core whether it be positive or negative. Now, reactivity is just is just some scalar that we use to try to quantify how fast, for example, the car is accelerating or deaccelerating. Um, and there's a lot of different things that affect reactivity, just like it would in a car, right? So we have fuel in the control rod or fuel in the fuel rods. We have control rods. We can also change reactivity by flow rod temperature, coolant temperature, and the different poisons that exist in, inside the core, uh, the ones we put there on purpose, and the ones we generate over time. And by the way, when we mean poisons, it doesn't mean something that'll kill you. A rod poison would be like boron. It actually absorbs neutrons easy. So you're dealing, with, you're dealing with the, basically the something that will interfere with the, yeah, the you, reaction. Yeah, you, you want to have a certain right. type of neutron flux density across the core, um, and you for any more even types of distribution and even fuel burning. So you add specific poisons to it, like boron, that will, will absorb the neutrons. I'm mean, understand. You know what kind of fluxes you're talking about, typically in a in neutron. What in a what the level of fluxes? Oh, yes. Yeah, that was I couldn't. Get it's it. like ten to the tenth yeah. uh, neutrons per. I don't know. I can't even remember now. But that's a big thing. Of, of, it's of a lot trying to get. Yeah. Uh, a, you know, a decent flux density equalized across the core, so you don't have uneven burning of your fuel. Yeah, right. And it's and it's one of the things. It. It's one of the things that that I mean, I, I've seen in numbers around five times ten to the tenth, four times ten to the tenth um, neutrons per square centimeter per second. Yeah, right? and it also depends uh, on what you have in the reactor. I don't mistake. But you have argon or some uh, xenon in there that that's going to change your your flux density as well. Because yeah, for example, after a yeah. shutdown of, of a like a, a, a scram. You actually have this yeah. big spike of xenon gas, and xenon is actually a neutron absorber as well. So that's going to affect your neutron density. You actually have to wait for that decays to go away before you start up again. In many cases, right. one of the one of the big challenges in engineering of fusion reactors, not fission reactors, fusion reactors, is that the flux densities we talk about there are around ten to the twelfth, about a hundred times greater, and that flux density causes you know mortal materials to basically crumble. Um, and so one of the one of the challenges of a of a practical fusion reactor is the ability to withstand the very very intense neutron fluxes. Now they have had some fusion reactors that have 
uh, you know, been working for quite some time. There was one, I believe it was an MIT that had one working for a sub substantial amount of time. It's just actually recently they got shut down a couple of years ago. But, but you know, their, their, their fusion, their, 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 that, that pulse or burst, basically what you do there is you use something like lithium to uh, liquid lithium to try and, and, and absorb and moderate that, that flux as opposed to, you know, water coolant. And and lithium coolant is a really nasty thing to to deal with. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna get into a little hopefully different types of coolant and how they how they yep. affect things. All right, moving on. All right, what do you yeah, got? So um, this this might be the last slide I have because we can talk about this for. We got more stuff. I can, I can I can throw some stuff out there. All um, right. Just kind of let but, you guys know this is the, the fission fragments that we're talking about that cause that have the kinetic energy that's imposing the medium to the moderator. That's that's these things here. Yeah, typically one's twice as big as the other. So just pretend that's right. Okay, let me. Um, that is it. So uh, let's, let's, now, now let's go to the actual math involved. Oh man, equations. You're gonna you're gonna kill it. Got a mathematician in here. Let's just do it. Yeah. Six go. factor formula. Oh God, this I I I had this was on my final, dude. This was actually on my review board, and I had a nuclear engineer that I had to like regurgitate this crap with. <laughs> um. So, so let's, let's make it kind of simple. I don't want to overload people. I, I mean, that's not my intent, but I, I want to kind of explain to people what is going on inside of the reactor. If you guys don't mind, you want to do that? Go for it. Go for it. I so let you know if you're nerd now too much. And if I'm right, I got to remember stuff. <laughs> so what's going on here is that the control rods of the reactor don't actually control reactor power. That's kind of a misconception. They do at some point during startup when it's called the point of adding heat and in some criticality range. But at working conditions, when the reactor is actually at criticality, meaning that the, the reactivity that Joe was talking about, the K-effective is called, K-E-F-F, -F, that from one generation to the next generation, there is no change on average of the amount of neutrons in the core. So in other words, once you've got the reaction going, um, it's not really a change. The, what we talk about generation, you're talking about you know, an atom splits, neutrons come out, they hit the next step atoms. That's another generation, right? When you when we have and, the, and so, and the so chain. You have what happens if you have more neutrons being produced per generation than than you do than you do in like a critical criticality. Crit criticality means that they're equal. Criticality means that you are from one generation to the next generation are the same. So if you have more than the amount of neutrons per generation, you have what's called super criticality, right? Not necessarily yeah. a bad thing. I mean, you actually have to go through a super criticality to get to criticality when you're starting these things up. But what that actually means is basically that you have more neutrons being produced per generation. And then subcriticality would be obviously less neutrons per generation. The moderator, the water, right, is what's going to affect how a large portion of how much moderation you have. As, as we mentioned, the U-235 likes to absorb slow thermal neutrons it presents what's called a macroscopic cross-section for absorption fancy term for saying what is the target size of the atom that it appears to to the neutron in the system so u-235 likes relatively slow neutrons if you have fast neutrons u-235 is not going to react and it's and and again you want u-235 to absorb that neutron because it becomes U-236, which becomes unstable, which splits and sends out two to three neutrons. Exactly. And that's a generation. Right? So each, each fission, these, you remember these, these neutrons are coming out at a high velocity, right? They're, they're actually fast neutrons. So we have to slow them yes. down so they'll go on to um, cause other chain reactions. And also, if, if Joe remembers this, um, there's something that is critically important in a, in a reactor to, to make it actually work. We do not want a reactor sustained solely by what's called prompt neutrons or serious source neutrons. Those are the neutrons produced per fission. We want to have a little bit of other neutrons mixed in. And where those neutrons come from are what's called delayed neutron precursors. These are come other fission fragments that it will go on later on to produce additional neutrons and produces this, this delay. And, and there's a lot of reasons for why we want that particular delay. But because of that, we are actually able to more effectively control the reactor and make sure that you do not have a supercritical type reactor. You want yeah, you, you don't you don't want an exponentially growing reaction unless you're making something go boom, in which case you do. But typically reactors are not designed to go boom. In fact, they really can't. 
Well, they can't because they're, one, you don't have the correct geometric shape for them to go boom, and two, you don't have enough fuel to actually go boom. So it cannot ever produce a atomic explosion, only a, something like a steam explosion. So these factors in here, they're, they're, they look a little bit complicated, but it, when you break them down, they're kind of not. What, what they're saying is, is that you have something like the first one was a thermal fission factor. These are the amount, these are all fractions, the ratios, except for I think one, but most of them are ratios. But like the first one is saying, okay, what is the amount of, of, of neutrons that are being absorbed by the fuel as opposed to something else, like some part of the system? Um, so, so it's greater than one, you'll get, you'll get you'll something increasing. Less than one, you'll get something decaying. Yeah, yeah, ratio, exactly. So you, wa you want to have more being absorbed by the fuel than you do uh, the structure, right? Because you want the fuel to actually produce something. So that that's all these things are. So you have the fuel utilization factor. Um, uh, uh, you have like the fast fission factor, which is the number of fat f fissions that are produced from um, the, um, the the initial fission event divided by the number of fissions uh, neutrons from fissions later on. Is that what it is? I'm yeah. trying to remember. This is this is like going back a long way because the fast fission, number of fission neutrons divided by the number of, of fission neutrons from just thermal the fast fission factor was the only one that actually had a, a had something that had to go yeah. back so so it's, yeah, it's it's the number it's the number of, of fission neutrons divided by the number of fission neutrons from just thermal fissions yeah some fissions happen from thermal fissions and oh, some fissions happen from, from fast, fast fission. fission okay yeah, yeah. Because you have a total number of fissions, and then you have ones divided by the ones that are thermalized neutrons. Yeah. Then you have your leakage factors. Um, these are actually neutrons that leak out of the system. So, so if you got if you got reactions at the very edge, right, and they go out outwards, they're not going to go and hit fuel, and so they'll that that's considered a leak. Right. And when you can tell you're dealing with macroscopic because you're dealing with summations. Um, these, some of these other ones, like these ones, are, uh, I believe this one is a microscopic cross-section for absorption. Um, and then some of the other things that we had to deal with was this little squiggle thing. We call it squiggle. But we called it the average logarithmic energy decrement per collision coefficient, no. also known as lethargy, or the amount of lethargic energy loss per scattering event. Yeah. This is basically as you have... A neutron going through that water, it, it's going to have what's called a mean free path, which is the average path it takes to, to hit one atom, lose a little bit of energy, slow down, hit the next atom, and it just does this path. Well, this is how much energy is lost per collision on the average. And how and, and so if water molecules are, are further away from each other because they're at a higher temperature, you have a longer mean free path. You have less uh, collisions going on. He also has less energy being transferred for collision. And so criticality decreases the hotter the temperature of the water, which is very, very important. So so let's let's say, for example, for some reason, you had a core with no coolant. That and would be called the pulling, loss of coolant. And, 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 and you'd start pulling out the, the reactor rods. What would happen? Okay, well, there's a couple things that, that, that will happen here. One, we generally don't have loss of coolant accidents. Most, most of them have what's called partial loss of coolant accident. What a partial loss of coolant is, is where part of the control rod mechanisms uh, or some fuel assemblies have been exposed to the steam or it's exposed to air or it's exposed to anything but being under pressurized water. And again, what happens then is you have loss of thermal conduction and you have buckling of that clating, that, that zerk oxide clating that goes around the fuel um, assembly. Uh, what do they call them? You, call, you guys call them rods. We, again, we had plates. With but, 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 but it's essentially the, the material holding those pellets begins to, to It'll buckle. be affected. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You don't want a partial loss of coolant because you remember the, the, the water is what keeps this reactor cool. Right. And when I said before that control rods don't recall, don't control reactor power, what controls reactor power at operations at criticality is your steam demand on that secondary side system. So when you, in, when you open up your throttles, you're allowing more steam to go into that turbine from the steam generator. When you do that, you draw more uh, heat from the primary loop. Through those, those, uh, Temperature drops in the primary loop. Yeah, actually, you know what? Let me just bring this up. As, uh, Let's not... go back to the picture. Let me see. Where's my presentation again? 
Hang on. Uh, let me get the presentation back up. Um, trying to close it. Gosh darn it. Go ahead and talk much so I get the, the so so again one of the things that that you have in in typically you know, again in reactor system the, the the water is has important functions it's absorbing the the energy of, of the particles bouncing around it also slows down the neutrons um, right and 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 remember U two thirty five the thing that that when it absorbs and and, and splits wants slow neutrons, not fast neutrons. So um, if you have a bunch of fast neutrons, your your U235 is not going to be very effectively absorbing that stuff. It's going, things are going to be flying out of the system and not um, not reacting well. That's correct. So, so if you had a reactor that had fresh fuel without any of the uh, fission fragments built into it, what would happen is if you pulled the rods if you pull the control rods out of the core to try to initiate a chain reaction, you wouldn't have a chain reaction because the core needs the water yeah. in order to create the reaction. Now that being said, if you took a if you took a core that had been partially uh, used and you pulled the drained all the water out of it and then pulled the the control rods out. What you would end up having is the, the the fission fragments that are inside the fuel rods. Uh, they will share their heat with now empty air, and air is not a good heat removal mechanism. No, nope. very poor. So what's going to happen is the the cladding, or excuse me, the the actual fuel pellet will heat up and expand, and then expand into the metal cladding around it. That's zirconium which, stuff, yeah. Yeah, the zirconium, yeah, the cladding. And that could either pop the cladding, you'll get a pellet clad interaction um, where the, the pellet expands to pop open the cladding uh, or it gets so hot that it just melts the cladding. And I think the, the melt temperature for Zerk 2 or Zerk 4, I wanna say is 20. Ours was uh, Zerk 1470. Fahrenheit or something like that. So they get it, this gets hot. See, we didn't have fuel pellets, and I, I hope this isn't classified because whatever. Uh, yeah, we, but, yeah. I, I, mean, I know well, we had. I, dude, I, I know we had. Um, but the, the, uh, we had fuel. We had fuel pellet. No, not fuel pellets, but um, they were like balls, I guess you can say. And they had a yeah. they had a necro um, like, um, an eight micron necrodia necro, uh, eight ah. eight micron um, niobium coating around it. That was used in the manufacturing, so it didn't crush these things when they were playing the, putting the cladding on the uh, fuel plate. So, one of the questions I remember at, being asked was, "What was the thickness of the uh, niobium coating on a zerc oxide fuel um, pellet or, or something like that?" And it was eight microns, but whatever. That they when I say that they mem made you memorize the most myopic shit, I'm not even exaggerating. So how many holes are at the top? I don't remember how many holes in the pressurizer nozzle. That was one of my questions. I don't remember what it was. Is it 216? I fuck if I remember. Joe, would you remember? <laughs> it's way more than that. Yeah, I don't remember. There's a lot of holes. They're really small holes. But uh, yeah. But I uh, yeah, why you never go, you never go into the pressurizer per per per, per, per bundle, I should say. For, yeah. So so let's kind of work through a transient here. Um so let me let's kind of explain this because let's assume this T hot loop right here is at at uh, 460 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is going to be for uh, 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So you have, you have a T average right now of 450 degrees. So on a transient, when you want to raise reactor power, this is what happens. This is what's really cool. You draw more off steam demand by opening up the throttles to the turbine here. And, and by the way, Joe, please make sure I'm on point here. You're good. All right. So you, you open up the, the steam demand. So you have more steam drawn off here, more water going in here, which means you have more water crossing these YouTube bundles, all right? And that means you have more time that this water going through here is going to be cooled off. So you have more of exchange of heat from these YouTube bundles to this secondary uh, flow. This is going to cause water from the primary coolant loop here to cool off faster, resulting in a lower temperature at the, at the exit of the, the cool, primary coolant loop here. This causes a lowering of the temperature of TC, is called. So you have more energy coming out here. You have a lowering of the water of the uh, water here, which let's say it goes down to T uh, TC equals 430, so it drops 10 degrees. 
What happens to the density of this water? What happens to water when it gets colder? The density goes up. Yeah, okay. that's true. And yeah, it's, as Joe mentions, this is called the negative temperature thermal coefficient of reactivity. And I'll explain to you what that means and why, and why that's critical in a pressurized water reactor as opposed to like a graphite cool. Because graphite or, has a positive temperature coefficient. Yeah, or Chernobyl. Yeah. Chernobyl had a positive temperature coefficient of reactivity. Yeah. Very bad. So, so <laughs> nuclear vessel. <laughs> vessel. Vessel. Show me your nuclear, nuclear yes, vessel. We want to see your nuclear vessels. <laughs> so this, this water gets denser. Now you have pumped into the reactor. Now, if the water's denser, which means the water molecules are closer together, the neutrons have a, less of a mean free path. And therefore, it takes less interactions and less time to become moderated. That means you have more thermal neutrons in the reactor core at that time. More reactor neutrons are going to be absorbed by the fuel based upon that six factor formula, that K effective, mm -hmm. which means that you have more fissions take place. Well, you have more fissions take place, you have more heat generated, correct? Mm -hmm. The water heats up and, and, and this tea hot will get warmer too. So what you end up having is you have basically this equalized here to this. So your tea average stays the same because this goes up, this goes down 10 degrees, this goes up 10 degrees and your tea average is the same. So, well, no, wait, no, 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 it's not. It's, so it's, when you're, when you're, when you're pulling out more steam, out transit condition, you're uh, going to cool down the, the stuff coming out towards the reactor, which means you're going to increase the density, which means you're going to cause more collisions, which means you're going to increase the the the, the heat coming out of the reactor. But the average is going to be the same. What's yes. going to happen is you have higher reactor power, but the T average between the T hot and T C on a transient steam is going to be the same. What what control controls the temperature average is the control rods. That's what these control. These are not control reactor power. Yeah. This controls the average temperature from T hot to T C divided by two. So let's just say, for example, you have a particular um, set of uh, control positions. You leave them fixed. When you pull heat by 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 pulling off steam from the material going back into the reactor, you change the density, you you increase the reactions, and you increase the the heat coming out of the reactor. Right. So yeah, by itself, that's a self-regulating thing. Yes, which is pretty cool, and that's what you want. That that's yeah, that's that's, that's to, good. If you're drawing right. steam out of this reactor and it's cooling down, and it, it basically doesn't change reactor power. It 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 you need actually to 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 actually make it go higher power. You have to do, to to um how how should I say this? I'm trying to think of a bigger way to describe a uh, negative temperature coefficient of reactivity. It doesn't produce thermal runaway effects. It doesn't produce criticality runaway effects. So no. you don't have to fight to keep this reactor from going out of control. Once you do the transit, it's a self-sustaining system. It'll equalize and it'll have a uh, the same T average with a higher reactor power on a transit. Or if you raise control rods, it'll have a higher T average, um, same reactor power. So, so, so one of one of the reasons third time. Yeah. So, so one of the reasons why. Uh, we in the West and now in the East um, consider pressurized water reactors to be ideal is this negative, we call it the negative thermal coefficient of reactivity. So as Steve explained, right, if we take colder water and we put it into the core, we get more power. Well, that, that occurs the other way as well. So if we get a localized point in the core that is generating way more heat than it should, we're starting to get a runaway reaction what it'll do is it'll heat up that water, which will make it less dense, which will slow down the reaction. Or if we start boiling off that water in that localized spot, steam doesn't moderate neutrons all that well, which means that the reaction effectively stops in that area of the core. Yeah. So so one of the things, folks, that, that you want to have in a nuclear reactor is you want to work at keeping it going. Right. You don't want something runaway so rational reactor design requires effort to keep the reaction going right rather than the other way around rather the other way around of saying you don't, you don't keeping, want effort to, to, to prevent it from going runaway that's that's the positive yeah it's like saying you got a car you got to push down the throttle to have it go and if you if you if you take your foot off the throttle it slows down and coasts you don't want something that's going to go and just you know you have to essentially hold back the brake in order to keep from from that was the brake wall and there's some other factors on Chernobyl too. There's uh, 
the, fa the fact that with a graphite structure, and this is going back to my metallurgy in, in Nuke School, some hopefully Joe remembers, but there's something called an interstitial point defect in uh, in a lattice, and an interstitial point defect allows for uh, the motion, the mobility of, of an atom to lose its place in lattice and go to a higher position. I think it's called a Wigner effect, if I remember. Yep. Um, and that Wigner energy, is that how you pronounce it, Wigner? Wigner? Mm -hmm. Wigner. Wigner. Is it Wigner or Wigner? I heard it Wigner, but maybe that was because uh, the, 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 I, 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 I just say it's Wigner. But I, basically, you know, I was I was an intern for Teller, so he said we're just we're going to call it Wigner energy. But what the Wigner energy is basically is that, and this was something I learned later on, by the way. But um, the Wigner energy is the amount of energy that's produced because of the um, the interstitial point defect allowing a atom to go a, to a higher potential level. And then when that crumbs back down, it releases an amount of energy. And, it, and of course, in, in a reactor, you don't want any extra energy going to the system that should not be there. So that's what the, the Wigner effect was. Interesting, right? Yeah. So, so back to this again with these reactor designs. Yes. I mean, the principle they're, 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 they're saying is that, that you know, when the, um, when the, when the temperature of the material going into the reactor vessel drops, that you get tend to get a temperature increase of the stuff coming out. So the average temperature remains the same, even right, though you're yeah. pulling off power. When you pull up the control rods, however, mm -hmm. then what happens? When you pull up the control rods, okay, let's, let's, let's do the thermal effect. So I'm raising the control rods. That means that more fuel is being exposed to that neutron flux that we talked about, right? So because there's always a neutron flux density. Because what a control rod does, control rods grab those neutrons and take them out of being effective in and keeping the chain reaction going yeah these are these are there's a couple of different ways control rods can be you have active rods and you have inactive rods and, and it depends on the system you're talking about let's just say for this system like the control rods are basically poison and then what you have was you have a control rod drive mechanism up top here and basically that's like a little screw with a, a magnet that causes it to turn and when you release those magnets it opens up like um like a, like imagine your hand and Give your on top of your dick, <laughs> yeah. you know, and you open up your hand, your dick's gonna fall, kind of like that, right? right? And that's that's kind of the thing. You know, same thing like in, in Reed. If you, you did, if you lost that. power in the control rods completely, you wouldn't want to do you that. But first reason, it would basically the control rods would would go down into the reactor and 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 slow the. Yeah, because these, these, these control rod drive mechanisms are, are energized by electricity, and so if you lose power power to those control CRDMs, they automatically open up because they're spring loaded, and the control rod my drive mechanism, assuming the control rods like slam down. But yeah. if I correct me if I'm wrong, on a boiling water reactor, the control rods come in from the bottom. That's correct. They come in from the bottom. Um, huh. There's there's a whole bunch of. And, th and that's what's fun, I guess, going from uh, and learning PWRs and then going to a boiler is a lot of the reactor dynamics are opposite. Yeah. So it's it's they, they still function roughly the same way. There's still a negative coefficient of reactivity. It allows for um, boiling in this loop a little bit. Uh, yeah, but there's yeah. boiling in the loop. And that's it, it, it's interesting effects. Yeah, they, they, they learned, you know, again, the control control or control rods are, are, are you know the hard way for example and uh, in Washington there is a reactor on Hanford where essentially the it was it was actually not moderated by by liquid but by carbon and um, there was a case where the reactor went reaction went too fast the control rods were ejected you know forcibly out the top of the reactor um, Fortunately, what happened is that explosion also dissipated fuel, and it didn't really go anywhere. But it, yeah, that's but, usually caused by a, a sudden flash of uh, water to, to, to vapor. Yeah, have, in the case this was this was carbon that cooking. that almost ignited. So um, it's not not genuinely well known, but but Hanford way back in the early fifties almost had a similar accident to Chernobyl. Hmm. So, so let's, let's just finish this. So, so I'm exposing more fuel to the neutron flux density here across here. So you basically you have more reactions. So the water's going to get hotter. Water goes through here. It goes through the U-tube. But look, at my steam demand is exactly the same. So I'm removing the same amount of, of energy as I always was. But this is a hotter loop. So the water's going to go through here. T-cold is going to go hotter too now, right? Because you're moving the same, you're extracting the same amount of thermal energy. And so... 
this goes up this goes up and back into the system and as this goes up it kind of equalizes out and so all you're actually doing is raising the t hot and you're raising the t cold and when you do that you increase the t average because t average is the th plus tc divided by two then if th goes up and tc goes up and divide by two then t average goes up and this is called qualitative yeah. analysis what you would do is you would just write little arrows over the th and an arrow over tc and show that those are increasing based upon everything being similar then the amount of t averages has to go up so that's what reactor control rods do is basically just raises the the average temperature of the coolant from the t hot loop to the tc loop that's it at criticality that's yeah correct. so so yeah, the, I mean, the if, you go reason, in, if you go in enough you'll you'll shut down the reaction right if you that's correct put them all in and, 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 yeah and, because and then, when your water gets too hot it's no longer acting as a very good moderator right because you're, you're yes very low density water and you're not getting the thermal effects from moderation that you would get with colder water now let me ask you um uh, landon cold water accident what do you think would happen if all of a sudden you ejected really cold water into this system at a too quick a rate what would happen well you're going to get some thermal shock which is very bad very bad you would also have a a very effective moderator which you probably don't want and so the you basically the opposite of what you would think it would be because you would normally say dump wa cold water on a on a on a reaction it would go down no dump cold water on a reaction it'll it'll rev up mm -hmm. and so you're you're basically putting very dense moderator in there so yeah you're going to have a, a very bad um, reactor incident if you have a cold water accident is one of the worst yeah. things going to have especially if I remember correctly. Um, at below the point of any heat on just on source neutral. This is by the way, ignore everything I'm just going to say here. Uh, this is for average Joe, but at the source, it's at, when you're on um, below the point of any heat and you're just on source neutrons alone, isn't the the uh, cold water accident the worst possible time? Yeah, we can prompt, for prompt, prompt yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and, so, and 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 you you'll you'll get mechanical shock on on your reactor vessel. Um, a lot of bad things will happen. Yeah, prompt criticality you don't want. Remember earlier I told you that one of the things that that we have to kind of rely on are these neutrons that are produced from delayed reactions called the delayed neutron precursors. There's actually, if I remember correctly, a, a formula for that. I don't remember the exact formula, but it, it comes out to what's called beta bar, I think. I mean, and think so, think about it this yeah. way: that, that you're you're, you're in a six four or something like that. Is that class? You're name? you're you're in a you're you're in a uh, vehicle with manual transmission. You've got the uh, throttle floor to where you're nearly redlining. And you pop the clutch in, right? That's kind of what the what happens to, uh, you know, a, a a reactor when you get this, you know, cold water flush. Um, lots of bad thermal shocks happen, and one of the things you do at that point is you basically throw in your control rods and you say, "What did we damage? And how bad is it?" Yeah, but I think what's worse would be when you're just on source neutrons alone. You don't have the delayed pre, pre delayed neutron precursors having any effect. You're not relying on that prompt criticality, or excuse me, that um, delayed neutron criticality. You're relying on only prompt criticality. So you are literally taking cold water, dumping it in there. So every neutron that's being produced from the fissions go on to cause other fissions, basically. So you have a runaway critical event. Um, yeah. That's not good. So, so people ask, you know, someone asked about uh, what happened at Fukushima, right? Um, where, you know, they, they were saying that, that essentially the, the, you know, they had it, that, that the earthquake had a problem. They had a loss of power and the reactor went haywire. Can you describe, or do you know? I don't remember. I don't, I have no idea what happened at Fukushima. Yeah. So uh, I was actually stationed in Hawaii when it happened. Um, and I was uh, performing an emergency reactor startup um because of the oncoming tsunami that was going to strike pearl harbor which ended up being three inches but so anyway what happened in in uh the fukushima fukushima daiichi plant um which are not that far away from the tohoku earthquake site where the the earthquake site received a, i want to say 9.3 magnitude um so what happened is uh, all the seismic sensors inside the plants, because there are six reactors there, I don't think all of them are built, and then several of them were shut down for refueling. Uh, the seismic sensors detected the earthquake and shut down the reactor safely. Um, so 
in that just that stage of, of what was going on, we ju the reactors just shut down. They scrammed. Um, what happened later is that the plants got hit by a 14-meter tsunami, uh, which was much bigger than the seawalls that they had to protect them um, from the ocean. And this went and flooded all the important stuff that they had. So it, it also killed two of their operators. Um, so this wiped out. So in addition to killing 20,000 people, because that's what the, the, the tsunami did, it also destroyed the electrical power distribution for that entire region. Like all of the state, so I live in Pennsylvania, the state of Pennsylvania, Jersey, New York, just gone. They, they have no power. Also, 20,000 people are dead. So the entire region is inundated with uh, an immense amount of emergency relief. And then now they have reactors who only have battery power. And they only have battery power for a little while because their emergency diesel generators were flooded and the emergency switch guard, uh, the, the emergency buses that connect that connected to the, the diesel generators and then to the plant support equipment to keep the core covered with water uh, were, were flooded. This is what controlled the primary pumps? Uh, so this was instrumentation. So so the, the Fukushima plants are boiling water reactors and they were designed so that they have some gravity uh, condensers that don't require power. The idea is that these condensers sit on the top of, above the core and you need power to operate the valves to open or shut, right? So if you have the valves open, water can go from the decay heat removal condenser system and then circulate water throughout the core, and it'll work for a while until you run out of water for your de heat, decay heat removal condenser. I forget exactly what it's called. Um, so after a couple days or, or hours, um, they lost all battery power, and they actually they actually started to sacrifice vehicles. So guys would go out and rip car batteries, and they rigged car batteries in the control room to make sure that they could have power for instruments like uh, your thermal couples inside the core, uh, if your pumps were running and status of valves. So, so now we have a hot reactor, uh, a, a shut down, a properly shut down reactor that still is generating heat from thermal decay of fission fragments, right? We lost the ability to cool because the operators decided to shut the valves for that decay heat removal system because they were cooling down the core a little bit too fast and then they shut it and then they lost power to reopen them. So now the core is slowly overheating and slowly boiling off the water that keeps the fuel assemblies covered which prevents them from melting. Now, at that point, they were just totally screwed. All they were trying to do is keep it from being exposed to to get. They didn't want the fuel assemblies to actually start melting. Correct. Right. Um. And they tried everything they could. The problem is, is it it's like trying to get help from the state of New York after New York City's. I don't want to draw nine eleven a comparison, but it but it's. 9-11 on, on a scale of six times higher, right? You're not going to get help from the NYPD after an event like that where 20,000 people are dead. And then there's whole whole towns and villages that are gone. So they were kind of on their own. Whereas so, in, the United, in, in the United States, you know, if I, if I call up a plant that's two hours from me, and we call the National Guard, the Air National Guard will show up with a helicopter to bring in whatever stuff we need. There's a little bit of coopetition between nuclear power plants in the United States where we help each other out as much as we can.
Yeah, well, the United States has a has a you know a much better uh, uh, industry and health and safety safety culture than the Japanese. Yeah. Did. So, so really what was what was so fundamentally much. wrong with the Japanese nuclear power? It was on a fault system. That was that. Uh, uh, so some of the biggest problems were that they're they're they had only recently done safety evaluations on what could be considered a 10,000 year tsunami. And they just come out and said that what they thought was a 10,000 year event is actually a 1,000 year event. And they're due for a 1,000 year event, which was a, a you know, the tsunami, uh, the, the Hoku earthquake and tsunami. So unfortunately they got this report and they sat on it for a few years before they reinforced their seawall. Um, and if you look a little to the north of that plant, they actually have another nuclear site that was closer to the earthquake. Um, and this place had updated its seawalls and suffered no damage whatsoever. Do you think that they could have updated the seawalls from where they were at? Because, I mean, you can go halfway down a beach and the, and the amount of tsunamis going to could be different. It's, it's a mix of around. both. You know, like I, I work I work a little bit in the design um in, in a design facility at, at my plant. Um, and it's it's real hard first to get the money to do something like that. But the the safety analyses, because there's there's a ton of computational analysis has to go in on how you can bond concrete to concrete, right? Because if you're going to do concrete, you need it to be a continuous pour with rebar. But now you're talking about because there's already a, a seawall out there. How do you how do you effectively attach dried and old concrete with rebar yeah. to yeah. new concrete and rebar and get it seismically qualified? Right, because the bigger you and taller you make it, I would think you just have to build a house on the wall. <laughs> yeah, the 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 seismic concern now becomes more of a seismic concern. Right, because you have two things that are that are imperfectly bonded, and you're trying to make it bigger, and you have to prove that it can it, it can you know take a seven earthquake, and also resist a tsunami, which it realistically can't. You'd have to rip out the entire seawall. Um, was it a bad decision on their part? Yeah, it was a bad decision so, not to. So take, so so is it that is it the 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 fault, which is the placement of the nuclear power plant that close to the water's no. edge. No, or, I don't think so. Or is it the systems that they used that couldn't couldn't handle a loss of power? Uh, it's 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 a mix, right? Um, there was, you know, we talk. I think it's called the the Fukushima Daini plants, which are a couple miles to the north. Um, those plants were closer to the earthquake and the tsunami, and they suffered. The earthquake and tsunami with relatively no damage, um, but when we look at the the Fukushima uh, Daiichi plants, um, th those suffered from fr from what we were learning is they've got a safety culture problem, um, and comparatively. While their operators did a great job of trying to save the plant, their operators are not at the same level of training as uh, NRC operators in the United States or, or ones that are certified by the NRC in the United States. Um, this idea of, you know, when they go through and, and they show that they isolated their decay removal condenser uh, because they're, they're worried about their cool down rates. You know, like I can understand cool down rates are pretty important, but you, you can't cool the core and you are lighting the control room with flashlights and car batteries. At some point, you cool the fucking plant under any any way you can. Isn't that you know? kind of what happened with Three Mile Island with their PLOC that um, they had, if I remember correctly, they had, they had a computer system running to the thermocouples and we have what's called instrumentation and control, or IC. And the people in the control room were actually, if I'm not mistaken, were ex uh, naval uh, nukes. Now, I could be wrong on that, but that's kind of what I heard, but could be rumor. But I do remember that they had the thermocouple readings that were the core in indicative power 
uh, excuse me, the core integrated temperatures on the thermocouples, which are just basically two dissimilar metals. You heat them up and they can produce a voltage between them. Then you measure that amount of voltage and that is your instrumentation. So as it heats up, you, you get an idea what your, your reactor temperature core is, uh, temperature is across the core. And the computer they had couldn't recognize how high these temperatures were going. And I think it produced like a question mark and they didn't yes. know how to interpret that. And they thought that these were just bad thermocouples. Right. They thought they were just. Yeah, and then the, the other thing that, that killed them was uh, that that pressurized uh, the uh, the pressurized relief valve they had. Well, they overrode. They started overriding their the thing. The, 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 the automatic system. Yeah. First, first, if you know, if and what kills me a little bit is like if the operators were asleep the entire time during this thing, it would have been fine. It probably it would have been, been better. Fine. Yes. Yeah. It would have been yeah. shut down. Because look at remember those two remember the the, uh, the the two things I said on the pressurizer you have let's say you have a steam relief valve and you have a water relief valve right what happened was it was heating up so much and there was so much pressure in that system that the steam valve went off if I remember correctly they actually manually went in and overrode that and then they yeah, just yeah. Did the, the, the water valve yeah, they they, they manually they overrode they, those things I yeah, I don't know why the God's name any reactor operator would ever override a primary relief valve well it's not so much that they overrode the primary relief valve what happened is they overrode the high pressure and coolant injection system which they thought right because their indication was that the core temperature was okay and that the pressurizer was full so they shut down the pumps on the high pressure injection yeah that's because that's, because that's they thought bad. having Stupid. Right. They thought they thought having a full pressurizer meant that they were OK. But what what that really led well, you don't to want that. You want that steam. Yeah. yeah. And, and not understanding that your pressurizer has a leak through the, the pressurizer relief valve means that uh, you can get weird pressure oscillations inside the core, which ended up they created a steam bubble in the core and not in the pressurizer. Right. You want to have the steam in the pressurizer, not yeah. in the core. Um. And then, then you started to get as as zircaloy starts getting very very hot, it undergoes zerk water interactions, which creates uh, hydrogen hydrogen gas, which then uh, can pop sometimes. I won't I won't say it detonates, uh, but it it accelerates. Uh, it can definitely accelerate things. Bad things going on in the. So, yeah, you oh, went away for a second. Gonna, gonna a little glitch there. Sorry. Yeah. Um, and so the, the, he said that the, they shut off the ECS, emergency, emergency cooling system, and then they, the primary relief uh, valve stuck open, and, and they, they did not, or they did close the, uh, the relief valve. Uh, they, they had indication on the other side of the control room, so they actually didn't, under, they didn't know that it was left open. So they had no idea. And so she was saying that they didn't want to let the pressurizer fill with water, so they shut off the HP injection. Well, it was full. Wow. So they had the core. They had the core uh, full. What they thought was the core was full of water, and then they thought the pressurizer was full of water, and there was no water leaking. Did they have an intermediate uh, injection system that kicked in or anything? Which uh, they over they overrode them. They overrode. Okay. Um, and hips, your high pressure and coolant injection system is going to, right? So if we, <clears throat> at, at, even at my boiler, if we have an issue and we scram, usually hips will kick in uh, and we have to override it. So like if we scram and we know the reason we're scramming, Hipsy will still, the high pressure and coolant injection system will still kick in to try to keep the core covered. And then we have to go through and manually override it. Um, and for them, what they saw was a core full of water and a pressurizer full of water. And they thought that all of the valves that could have water go out of the primary loop were shut. Because they thought that pressure relief was shut. But it wasn't. It was leaking water all over the place. But one of the issues they had is that everything in the control room has an alarm and nothing had a turn off this stupid alarm button. 
right? Yeah. And so, so uh, they basically had an overload of various alarms with no idea as to which alarms were critical they, they and which alarms were right. just noisy. Right. right. And right. that's something that the Navy took on board. You know, I've been, I've been in our simulators and I've been in our control room when we've scrammed and it's like eight alarms all at once. And TMI was like 40 alarms for 40 hours or something like that. Uh, and just screeching alarms. And there's just no way to communicate. People had like operators in the control room would have to leave the control room to talk about what they were going to do to go back into the control room to do yeah, it. That, that makes no sense. See, we had, we had, we had a, con okay. Inside the, 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 um, Command and control. What was it? Was it command? What was it called? The what the hell was the freaking name of the? Um, I can't remember the name of the uh, place where they get the. Uh, where the shims are the shim. What's that hell they're called? Um, the engineer officer watch days in there. Nice cool. Yeah, maneuvering. Ah, uh, whatever. It wasn't even maneuvering. Uh, but basically, we had this reactor control panel, and the reactor control panel had this little thing like uh, you grip on, and it was basically it was called a shim. You could turn it to the right. You could turn it to the left. And you you actually control reactor control rise by it. If you moved it a little bit to the right, it would go a little bit down. And you do this very very sparingly. You just like turn it like a half a second or a second, and then you put it back in the normal position. And then you can go the opposite way. And then all the indicator lights you had red and orange indicator lights. Red would be something that you really needed to look at, and then orange would just be an indicator light of some kind. Um, I the only thing that I think that actually emitted the sound. Um, were high temp pressure, temperature conditions, um, something along the lines of battle short, I think, had an alarm of some kind when you're in battle short condition, which basically prevented the, the reactor from, from scramming in a battle situation, which could only be used during wartime, um, and a few other things. But there's a lot of indicator lights. I mean, there's a lot of things on that panel, and you had to know every goddamn little one of them and what it meant if it popped up during an emergency because they'd run simulations all the time. And, and Joe... You might be able to, to, to tell people about this. What do you remember? What the very first thing you have to do on any casualty when you when you're, you're being tested on anything? The yeah. first thing you want to do is scram. <laughs> okay, fair <laughs> enough. What, 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 what what's the very thing? First thing you go to before you you start doing your your emergency procedures? Your procedure manual. Your procedure manual. Uh, you, know, you, you have you have a checklist, right? You check same thing. Same thing like in your pilot. It doesn't matter how memorized you have, you go back to the checklist. And, and do you know how we scrammed our reactor? I don't know if it has on your plan, but we had our reactor scrammed was we had on the ship's service turbine generators, a lube oil sensor that when you flip the little switch on the ship service turn a regenerator, the low pressure of the lube oil drop across the duplex strainer would cause the, the control rod control rod die mechanisms to open. <laughs> So basically, the machinist mates scram the reactor. Um, I only had to do it two that I remember, um, but they're all under control conditions. So, but we don't want to scram the reactor too much because what happens is you're slamming those control rods down at a, at a very fast rate to shut down that reactor. Well, that produces a lot of stress. And, and as, as Landon had said before, one of the things you don't want to do is produce thermal or mechanical shock. Which, which I'll say is funny because I want to say on my submarine. On average, we probably scram twice a day for training. Wow. For real. Yeah. Wow. Because yeah. constantly going through, we, we did drills. Uh, did you actually simulate or did you really scram? We really scrammed. Really scrammed. Wow. I yeah. didn't have to do that often. We really scrammed. We really isolated loops. We really operated on one condenser. We really operated on one steam generator. Oh, we did that. Um, yeah. We had to do everything. Um, like you had, a, we, we had three. Uh, feed pump and you know what would happen if they went out kind of thing so, somebody asked what is scram oh. scram actually will, if I remember correctly went subcritical reactor axemen is what it stood for yeah yes. something like that basically there was a guy like in, in the days of uh, Fermi's graphite reactor there was a guy with an axe who could cut the rope and and the rope, the boron and the rod, rods would drop and down the, into and the yeah. rod would drop into the core and then stop everything off. And and um, in addition to that, they had people with 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 buckets to dump in <laughs> in case they needed additional. Uh... So so Fred's got a question: How often do scrams happen? Uh, what I'll say in the military is we never scrammed for real ever, and huh. it was <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> it was crazy when I heard that another boat uh, had had what we'll call a half scram. Um, now in the civilian, you never had an emergency scram that was actually legit. Nope, not once. Um, now in the civilian world, right uh, in the United States, we have about a hundred reactors. I think you get to a quarter that scram. Yeah, by the way, I think the whole, I, I thought it was subcritical reactor X-Men, but I've also heard safety control X-Men, and, and it probably is kind of a, a myth of some kind, but that that is what I remember it standing for. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 there's, there's various um, technical terms, but, but you know, the original uh, carbon pile reactors had control rods with, with ropes that someone could, could cut. Like, or, was Chubert a nuke, just out of curiosity, or just he just was like uh, nuclear stuff? Who is Chu? Yeah, well, true. he's talking about scrams on his first boat. So, uh, uh, unless he's got a sailboat that's got a nuclear reactor, well, I mean, he might have been on a nuclear. Boat. Was, he actually, was he a nuke? Go through nuke school? I would assume. I mean, but uh, yeah, you know, I I thought that 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 scrams were sort of you know you go through drills, but you don't actually do. Yeah, but we we did it because again, well, we had a really old, old boat, right? And so every time you scrammed, it it did kind of lower the amount of. Um, uh, life expectancy of, of the reactor core and also you got to remember if you scram you have to wait to start up again because remember i mentioned this xenon production and we there's a lot of equations that go into to determining how much xenon's in a core how much left if you have a certain time i'm sure uh, average joe remember doing those uh, sumerian and xenon production rate equations um, it sucks uh, but there is a lot that goes into it and then you can say okay well after two hours i can start start raising control rods again um, because I don't have much, I don't have much poison in the core because xen xenon likes to absorb neutrons. Yeah, and by the way, uh, it, it is true, Bo, that uh, Fermi was the one that coined the the phrase. Yeah, so so I talked about scrams. Um, what I don't mean is that the reactor was doing something crazy, and then the control functions caused the the reactor to shut down. Usually, what happens is people are working on equipment. And that equipment sends signals to the, the control system and they use they they screw it up. So the core is never in danger. What happens is we end up sending a bad signal to the core processing system. And that's usually where you get well, the screw it's more ups. of an instrumentation control issue. Yeah, yeah, it's almost exclusively instrumentation. And, and so the control. good control system it's, essentially say that unless you give it a rational signal, it shuts down right and that's that's the the vast vast majority yeah of and then so scrams are, are essentially someone causing confusing people to come in and it says this is out of spec so i'm scramming to be safe yeah, the, uh, the vast majority of this shit is human error to say the least mechanical failure I, I at least on my ship is a very minor thing compared to the, the amount of things i've seen people fuck up on you know i mean we had a we had a guy that shifted a uh, and again uh, uh, Joe might be the only one that knows this, and maybe the uh, QM guy. But uh, we had a guy that was shifting a duplex strainer on the SSTG, and you know how you have that lockdown where you have the strainer and you, you lock it down, you shift it so it goes from one basket to the other, so you can clean one basket and the floor, floor of the oil goes to the other. Well, he's got to lock it down. So when he pressurized the other side, that blue oh, oil blew the fuck out and went all over the <sighs> lagging, the steam lagging. Yeah, and then the down, fire. The power. 140 yeah. degree engine room. You're 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 wiping down lube oil off lagging. Hoping it doesn't fucking ignite. It's it sucked. Worst day of my life. You haven't been in a 140 degree engine room with no AC. Yeah, you know, I have. It's yeah, bad. not very fun. Now, what it something you should take a look at at a later date is to take a look at uh, bearings that don't require lube oil. You mean a, a self 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 contained bearing? Yeah, because they have self contained bearings that don't require. Oh uh, no! Okay. No, it's way better. So okay. so but that's all bearing, about that. bearings were actually were not talking about that. They were so we should, of oil. They weren't sealed. We should ask because it's, it's been come up uh, actually twice now. Um, the so called China syndrome movie and your thoughts on that. Oh. Uh, Bullshit, so, but partly, part, we'll go to China, but a meltdown can 
can do some major damage. I mean, it will melt down to the reactor vessel floor at least. The container. So, at, so if you guys have seen, uh, and, and maybe Steve can look this up. Uh, so muons are high energy particles that mm -hmm. uh, come from interactions with our atmosphere from the sun. And those pass through almost everything except for slightly denser material than everything else, which is nuclear fuel because it's uranium. Um, so they have done muon scans of the Fukushima reactors where you can see that the fuel is not in the core. That's where right. did it go? It went into the, the, the containment vessel right underneath it. Yeah, that's not and good. And in fact, uh, in, in my cubicle at work, I have pictures from their drones that they sent in, which usually fry. Yeah, it's funny you mention that because muon is actually used for, uh, we just talked about this on the non sequitur show, used for uh, penetrating the, the sphinx and penetrating yep. py a pyramid. And it is kind of interesting because, you know, all, it's, it's one of the science that all kind of blends together. But we were talking about this even before then. One of the ways they determine special relativity to be true is the fact that muons normally have about a, a decay rate of about 10, I think, to the negative 6 or negative 7 seconds yeah. very, very quickly. But because of special relativity, the fast the, the speed that they're going, the speed at which they're producing the upper atmosphere to the ground produces a very small, small. Uh, uh, it's a distance. time dilation effect. Yeah, time dilation. Yeah. And so they're actually about twenty times longer uh, in lifetime. So these these muons that should die, you know, in a, in, a, in less than a fraction of a second, yeah. take about twenty two seconds to actually to they live, and so. It is a validation of special theory of relativity because of time dilation, what's called Lorentz time dilation or time uh, Lorentz contraction. And it all blends together, right? I mean, this is yeah. amazing how that. No, how you talk no, about muons and it, boom, you, you, mu, you, muons. You, there's, there's a, you know, basically in, in the nuclear you know, family of, of particles, um, you have three types of electron, leptons, electrons, muons, and tau particles. And about 10,000 muons uh, reach um, every square meter, centimeter. Uh, every square meter of earth each minute, right? So any minute you have about 10,000 muons hitting it. These charged particles are generally byproducts basically of cosmic rays, high energy particles colliding with you know, uh, molecules in our upper, upper atmosphere. Um, and they can, you know, muons can penetrate, you know, tens of meters of rock or other material um, um, quite easily. Yeah, I remember you had a your pion muon. They're basically like electrons, but um, yeah. And then you had three you had three different types of neutrinos. You had a muon electrino, a tau neutrino, and an electron neutrino. Yeah. But muon muons decay have a bigger decay thing. There's 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 um you know there's actually a, a pretty good article in uh, surprisingly a good article in Wikipedia on muon M U O N. <laughs> oh yeah. M E W O N. Just see, let's see. Just, just, do you remember what Chinyankov radiation is? Yes. Okay. Yes. What's Chinyankov radiation? When you have a charged particle that is moving faster than light in a medium. God damn! Is there anything that he just got doesn't fucking know? And in fact, wow, it's a that, beautiful. That it's a wonder. really beautiful. That's one nice thing about open water reactors is that Chinyankov radiation. It, 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 it's not quite correct, but. You could think of it as like the sonic boom. It of, is a good analogy, I think. And it, of it of you know, particles moving. Now remember, the speed of light in a vacuum is ultimate speed, but the speed of light in water is slightly less. Come on, what is it? Well, I don't know what fraction it is, 99 point something. <laughs> I believe isn't isn't it three quarters it's, of the speed of light? No, I think it's much higher than that, isn't it? It's not that much of a difference. I mean, I know it slows down in water, but I don't I don't remember how much. But, it, but the fact is that you have charged particles going faster than the photons from the same medium. Go Google, man. That's what we have Google for. Right. Speed so, of light in glass is, as always, is, is um, you know. Glass slows down, too. 1.5. 1, 1. Oh. The, the factor is 1.5. So it's 1.33. Is, is it three-fourths? I didn't think it was that much. Google Foo, activate. If you guys want to see something that. cool. Uh, so the Penn State test reactor, which was designed to go into space, 
Uh, we have YouTube videos online, but that was designed to go prompt, critical, and survive. Hmm. Yeah, like I said before, you don't want to have you don't want to have a reactor just on prompt criticality. Starting yeah. up a reactor is a very long, intricate process, and you have to use very intricate equations called startup rate equations. And I'm sure Joe had to memorize them and regurgitate them on a blackboard that took him oh, several, right. yeah. uh, several uh, I won't say hours, but how, how long would you think? The, you by guys, the way, the reactive, in, reactive index, I remember now, what is it? reactive index of, of, of water is 1.3. So the speed of light in water is divided by 1.3. Okay, well, that's, that would be around 230,000 okay. uh, kilometers per second rather than 300,000 kilometers per second. It's not that big of a difference, though, is it? 1.3? No. Yeah. It's it's enough that that those you know, those, those, sure. those those electrons being kicked out you know by the reactions and going faster than you know C over one point three um, will generate the string cough radiation. So, so let me ask Joe, Joe, how long did it take you when you had a problem that inv involved like startup rate equations or beta bar or um, especially reactivity addition rates, and you, you were told, okay, this is your operating parameters, you raise rod height, you know, one centimeter. Or what's your final this and that? How long did one of those problems obviously take you? I mean, they could, they could be 45 minutes. I mean, they're usually multi, multiple step. Uh, and, if you, and if you fuck up the first part. <laughs> yeah. And then do, you're. Do you remember? Do you, okay. Like I, say, I, I love, I love these kind of spontaneous questions. CE. What does CE stand for on a test? That I remember. Conceptual. G GCE. No, There's GCE G is gross concept error. Yeah, gross conceptual error. There's there's CE conceptual error, which was eh. There's gross conceptual error. I mean, yeah, What's you got CE this wrong. conceptual error. Okay. Yeah, just that, that was basically you, you made a little boo boo. GCE was made you major ah. boo boo. So and then, wait, and if you did, you made a major, major, major boo boo. You got a W2F TF. And what do you think that stood for? Yeah. <laughs> so understand C. Let's say three hundred thousand kilometers per second. Mm -hmm. You know. In round, in round numbers, is the speed of light in a vacuum. But speed of light in water is only 230,000 kilometers per second. So it's possible for a particle to go faster in water than light goes in water. And that produces the- It doesn't go faster than light, C. It goes faster than photons go in water. All right, let's see the next one. Um... Tell me what Bremstrahlung is. Oh, that's a good one. Oh, that's mm. breaking radiation. That's that's when particles go by. You know, you, it has to be it has to be in a charged field, uh -huh. right? And yes. it goes past a charged nuclei, and you get a deflection of that particle, and you get Bremstrahlung radiation because because of the, the deflection of the particle causes a deceleration, or I yes. should say, uh, because of a negative acceleration. Yes, and that breaking causes a um, radiation to be reduced, and that's called Bremstrahlung. Yep, yep. Very good. So, no, so, so now um, one of the things that, that I guess, you know, you should uh, talk about with regards to, um, again, um, reactors is, is how would you evaluate the safety of civilian reactors versus, let's say, reactors in the Navy? How would you compare? It's tough. Um, Cause what I'll say is coming from both sides. Like, so the military has uh, an infinite source of money compared to the <laughs> civilian world. Okay. Um, but that being said, the operators on a submarine tend to be young high school graduates. Whereas the operators on the civilian reactor I work at and other civilian reactors tend to go through 18 months of training, have to have a college degree or Navy experience, and they tend to be in their mid thirties. So they're older and usually more, uh, usually high, uh, better educated. That being said, they also have more complex systems, uh, systems that, may not be maintained as well as the Navy because the Navy does have infinite money. And also they don't really pay their, their labor force anything more, right? Uh, excuse me, a reactor operator at a civilian nuclear power plant can make a uh, hundred and twenty to $170,000 a year. 
Whereas a reactor operator in the Navy makes $36,000 a year. And the but reactor compared operator- to the, Compared to the, uh, like the civilian sector, where would you place the quality of training that a nuclear reactor operator or person who qualifies, engineering watch supervisor at least, which is the highest position I qualified, where would you position them on how much work goes into that? Uh, I probably put them close to the same. Generally speaking, um, the training processes are are pretty similar. The only the only thing that that the Navy get really gets over the civilian counterparts is uh, drills every day for years. I mean, when I was on the sub, I I we had two drills a day, every day. But would you say this is a pretty in depth? program to say the least yeah without a doubt yeah. it's an in-depth program i mean um, i i had a, i had a privilege of actually going on a, a navy nuclear sub um it, well, as a civilian right and and to do with some clocks but let's put it that way and um we when people talk about have you been to the north pole i talk about i've been under the north pole um and and it was courtesy of the navy i was extremely impressed with the people on that, on that sub, I could ask them any question, no matter how esoteric and they knew the answer right away. It wasn't think it was like they, they understood. And I asked what's the procedure for blah, blah, blah. And they go, you know, you have this competitiveness and you also, by the way, once you get qualified, you are the one qualifying other people. You're signing their qualifications. When, before you either do anything, with the reactor itself, you have this big old freaking book and it's huge and it has these signature slots and you go up to people and you say, can you check? It sounds weird, but can you check me out on a particular system? And they'll, the first thing I ask you is like, okay, draw the entire electrical distribution system of the plant or draw the entire pressurizer system or, or, you know, you know tell me about um, how this particular si system works. There's a lot of different systems of the plant. We just went over a, it's a minor amount of systems. Uh, you can talk about the AC system, the, 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 uh, the, the, the water reclamation, you could talk about all kinds of different stuff. So they could talk about anything and they say, okay, well, draw me the system. Now explain to me this. What do you hear? What happens if this is that? You are constantly inundated with emergency procedures and qualifications every, what, two weeks? By annual mm -hmm. recalls? I mean, you're just taking tests all this time. And these tests could be on anything. You know? So I was, I yeah, was that's, that's extremely actually, impressed with. So, so that lends to uh, some strengths for the Navy, right? Because you live and you breathe, you get used to uh, how the, the plant operates because you live 30 feet from it in my, you know, in my case. Uh, so, so you get really good because you have nowhere else to go. And it's the only thing you can really take pride in on a submarine because it's not like you're going to buy a nice car to, take underway with you you know uh so so really the only competitive edge you have on other people is uh your reactor knowledge and like bullshit manual knowledge of like uniform regs and all sorts of silly stuff but yeah it was that. Uh, but what steve was talking about was you know we people stay on the boat for only four years and then they're gone they go someplace else they leave the navy so you get some guys who stay, but they may not be, you know, this might be their second boat, but this isn't, this is a new plant for them. Whereas some of the guys who work at the unit on mat have been there for 25 years. And that's the only plant they've been on. So there, there is a little bit of that mix. Um, and they you want know. you to stay because look at, I mean, at that particular time when you are that familiar with the system, they want you to be able to train other people. Matter of fact, even if they you can't stay on the ship, they want you to go to uh, prototype or they want you to go to NPU, uh, 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 Naval Nuclear Power School or Naval Nuclear Training Unit, and instruct them. They they don't want to let you go because they've invested a quarter of a million dollars in you already. It takes about an average of a quarter million dollars to to train a nuke to get them the way they need to be for proficiency through the yeah. pipeline. On on the other hand, you know, as I saw with the drills. If there was a unusual situation reactor, I'd want to be on a Navy managed reactor because those people understood procedures and you wouldn't have somebody turning off sensors because it annoyed them. 
right? Um, right. Um, so, so again, there's a little bit of a, a, a mix between the two because in one sense, uh, what the Navy lacks in automation technology, they make up for in manpower. Yep. They have a lot of disposable people that they can just throw on problems. Um, but we were talking about Three Mile Island. Nothing would have happened at Three Mile Island if the operators did nothing because the, the systems are so well automated with so many backups that oftentimes the operators are the things that hurt the reactor and because because we have the automation technology to make sure that those things don't happen right if that makes any sense right there we have primary backup systems we have secondary backup systems we have tertiary systems you have redundancy and, upon redundancy you have triple and, and you have double and, and most, triple redundancy. Yeah. yeah and most of them are just automated yeah. all you're there to is basically do the, the menial shit. yeah I mean, I mean, there are some things like, oh, for example, I want, I want to change the mound, the, the primary feed pump. We had like two steam, one electric. You had to light them off, and that took something you had when you lighted off the, the generators. Um, but basically, once the, the operate the plants at operation, um, you really don't do a hell of a lot. You t you know what your primary function is? It's taking logs. You were literally yep. every hour on the hour going around the the the, the, the entire yep. whatever your, your 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 watch station is, and you're logging the temperatures. And pressures and whatever else you need to log levels and stuff. Yeah, you really don't do a lot. You make sure stuff doesn't light on fire, and that's really yeah, that's really the biggest thing. Now yeah. you get very you get very good at the drills because they make us do them twice a day. Full drills, full scrams. Oh my god, flooding is is catastrophically affecting half the engine, uh, half the uh, the electrical uh, buses. So you've lost half your electrical. What do you, and, do? What do, you yeah. do, sailor? Oh. Yeah. And actually go through it. Actually start isolating. Actually, you know, like we'll actually lose control function from our steam generator water level control system because we lost an electrical bus. We actually lose hot well level control. We actually lose part of our pressurizer heater banks. Um, you yeah, should get used to it. The, what we just went over tonight is not even scratching the surface of what we're going to the entire nuclear pipeline, <laughs> to say the least. Because <laughs> I mean, you got to remember, in one day, you're taking you're taking metallurgy, you're taking um, electrical uh, BWE, you're taking um, mechanical theory, you're taking heat transfer fluid theory, you're taking yeah. water chemistry, you're taking uh, fluid theory and thermodynamics, you're taking, I mean. It's just ridiculous how much you're taking at one shot, shot. And these are not easy courses. No, no. And, and it's the other thing I, I was amazed by is just how little space a human being could actually exist in. <laughs> well, now, now I was, I, I, top I, had the, I had the privilege <laughs> of sharing the admiral's quarters with a, with a British admiral who was also being, you know, moving around by, by, by courtesy. And I remember the only guys he was showing me, you know, where, you know, his, his spot and he appointed, you know, and this spot. And I said, so that's where you store your kit. No, that's where I sleep. Right? You, you're able to cram it. I mean, the, yeah, the amount of space rack. that they could cram human beings into. You, you sleep in what's called a coffin rack. That's what it's called. It was just, you know, but anyways, we gotta wrap, we gotta wrap this up. I got, I got some other stuff to do. Um, so highest respect for the, for the Navy's nuclear program. Well, thanks very much. I appreciate you guys coming in. I hope people kind of enjoy this it was a very, very quick, dirty, quick and dirty primer. On, I understand uh, how how long did it take for you to you know from from beginning your training to where they would let you near a reactor? About two how, years. About two and years. Yeah. Two years and how much you know how much time? So that's two years. That's not two years of college. That's that's more than two, two years, years of college. Yeah, that's two yeah. years of intense. Yeah, I mean you got to remember they they I mean you're taking 300, 400 level classes and sometimes w one of the classes that we took was was for system in, uh, instrumentation. That was a fourth year college level course. Yeah. So. Yeah, basically, basically, uh, you know, after I went through Penn State, um, the Navy nuclear power tra training pipeline is roughly three years of a nuclear engineering degree just without the calculus. And I, 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 I didn't finish mine, although I took calculus. Yeah. I took a lot of courses in college, but they, they were just all over the place. I, I took accounting, I took astronomy, I took biology, no. I took history, I took calculus, I took physics, but I didn't finish my degree in engineering. But I know I have, a like he said, I probably have about two-thirds of my way of a degree for nuclear engineering, although 
I didn't finish. So you know what? I, I didn't finish. Whatever. But I no, think I, I know a river. I I did not have a wreck. I I I shared half of a admiral suite with a British admiral. But, but I got to tell you, I'm I'm actually I and we had we there. I was I was I was I was in high heaven. I, that was. But you do this all the time, like you do math all the time. For somebody like myself who does not do this shit all the time, um, it takes a lot to recollect the stuff. I mean, I I don't. Oh, I mean, and, and these books, you know, I, I for example, the you know the admiral had me, you know, British admiral had me go in and give people uh, calculus drills, <laughs> right? And and they 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 did very very well. I mean, again, the people on that nuclear stuff were not dummies; they were no, actually they were quite. Yeah. Yeah, quite, quite impressive. So let me ask you guys. Um, well, one second, civilian one reactor one programs. About, about, I gotta say this. Abad said you, but you never took a course in ATP synthase. You'd be wrong. I did learn about ATP synthase and the Krebs cycle and um, <laughs> glycolysis in biology in college. And when I hear somebody else that we both know talk about this kind of stuff, I'm like, okay, um, yeah. <laughs> so. No. So being a civilian on on, on on military thing has has its has its perks, um, and particularly I didn't get yelled at. That was some something. Well, there's two things: yelling at people and being run over by people going from point A to point B. Yeah, you see somebody like hauling ass through a sub. Yes, get the fuck out of the way and let them. Go. Yes, that's that's what I learned. You know, they would they would they would politely excuse themselves as they were trampling me. Yeah, I, <laughs> I ask my but, but just tell them. Just say make a hole. <laughs> so, 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 in civilian programs, you know, which country do you think has the best civilian reactor program? And which country has the worst? Well, I, I, think, I, mean, I think we have the best, but I don't know who the worst is. I don't. I don't think we have the best civilian power program. Um, I think is good. France, France, France is good. Um, uh, I'm jealous sometimes. France because they are exploring new technologies. Um, their government allows them to build like the AP-1000, which is uh, Westinghouse's new, newest, safest pressurized water reactor, which uh, the United States really struggles with getting approval for some of these designs. Well, well the Westinghouse and, were the aircraft carriers, right? The A5Ws. Uh, yeah, that's all going to Bechtel now. Yeah. So it's all going to be B. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, and my it's, ship, by the way, I asked. I was on the USS Truck since CGN thirty-five. It's it's a um, moth. It's all um, razor blades now. It's been long since torn apart. So uh, I did. I did get to meet a bunch of people on the HMS Vanguard, and they are very. They are pretty smart, but uh, it doesn't seem like they have a big enough nuclear uh, nuclear navy to to have you know like real proficiency because they only have what like four nuke boats. And we've got 40, 30 something. I don't know. Got to wrap this up, though. I'm being paged. So, Landon and, and Joe, um, thank hey, you very It's been much. a pleasure. I'm, I'm, I hope, hey. folks, uh, we can do this again. More, more discussion together, about but... the more you know about nuclear power, the more informed you can make decisions or in, encourage your elected officials to make intelligent That's decisions. That's what we're trying power. to do. I agree. I definitely agree so. with that. Hey, Steve, thanks very much. Thanks very much, Landon, for, for talking to me about nuclear physics for a while. So Cool stuff. And we'll, uh, I don't know, maybe we'll do this again on some other subject that we all can Yeah, definitely. Yeah, well, you, might, you might see me over in, in, in Discord. But uh, again, thanks very much, folks. And uh, thanks very much for your uh, service. It's been very much appreciated. Thank you. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. Good night.